everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. I'm your host, Chet Czar, and today we have a really fun episode. I have my good friend, old friend, amazing sculptor, amazing artist in general, Ryan Peterson. He's been on the podcast twice before, and we are going to discuss all things The Exorcist. And this is in honor of William Friedkin, the director, just dying uh, last week, I think. And um, uh, we, we, he, Ryan had this idea to, to talk about The Exorcist because it's a movie we both really love and it's a classic. And uh, he contacted me, I don't know, a month ago or something about it. I said, yeah, we should do it. And then Friedkin died and I was like, okay, maybe we should, maybe it's a perfect time to do it. So... Uh, anyway, really fun episode. It goes in, uh, as usual, goes in a lot of different directions, um, really focusing on the artistic merits of the project and uh, what goes into making great art. So we get a bit philosophical about um, art in general, dark art, art, you know, just art in general, really. And um also, we, we talk about some AI stuff and a lot of different, a lot of different things. Um, <clears throat> so it's a great episode, really fun, and I'm and I'm uh, looking forward to posting it and having you hear it. Uh, what's been going on with me? Well, you can probably see behind me if you're watching on YouTube. Oh, I want to say, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. I hate to say it, but I have to. If we're getting little by little. We're 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 getting. Uh, into the algorithm on YouTube, and it seems to be bringing in a lot of new um, listeners, and and that's what I'm trying to do with this podcast is just get it out to more people. Anyway, uh, so if you could do that, that would be really helpful. And share it, that would be great too. If you could share it. Uh, anyway, yeah. So I've been working. I'm um I've got the craziest this month and next month. They're going to both be insane. I've got um. Some some group shows I'm in, which I think I mentioned last episode. I've and and now I'm painting all these little paintings you can see in the background, um, these two by three inch paintings that I made a couple weeks ago. No, a month ago. I don't remember. Uh, these ones have are gonna have a glow frame. I've got a little custom frame. These ones are gonna have glow in the dark frame, and glow in the dark elements on the painting. And uh, I I did one kind of to see what people would think and people loved it so I'm now I'm painting a bunch because I've got another huge bill business expense to pay at the end of the month and then next month I got to do my taxes and that's going to be bad <laughs> so I'm trying to make as much money as I, as I can on top of these group shows these three group shows I'm in and then I've got um Next month, I've got a, a speaking engagement with my friend Mitch Horowitz. Who's the, he's been on the show. He's a great writer, a, a cult scholar, and just just super great person. Uh, I love Mitch. He's, he's just awesome. And so we're going to do a, a talk at um, the Philosophical Research Society in Los Feliz in L.A. And uh, we're going to do a pre presentation of my artwork and talk about dark art and uh in general and uh yeah it should be super fun so that's coming um september uh i think the the the, the september uh 20 20th uh oh no okay i should have written this down let me look okay i'm gonna look i'm gonna look um if i take too long i'll edit it out uh, but I really try not to edit this podcast. Okay, it's September 20th, 7 p.m. at PRS, Philosophical Research Society. So hopefully you can come out if you're in the L.A. area and join us. It'll be a great show, I promise. Um, so yeah, and I have to get ready for that. I have to get my presentation ready for that. So I, 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 there's just so much going on. I was just telling my wife the other day, it's like, I just don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do all this. It's... Uh, it's really difficult not to get completely stressed out about it, but um, you know that's an art in itself. Is is just you know maintaining a a level of uh, calm that is required to make nice paintings. Uh, 
you know, you have to really kind of relax and get into it. And at the same time, have all this pressure bearing down on you. It's not easy, but this is the life I signed up for. This is the art life. Uh, and that's, I just got to deal with it. So anyway, um, if, if you want to support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash dark art society and join for as little as a dollar, get your name read on the air, get entry into the private Facebook group, get entry into the discord. And, uh, if you join at the $5 and above level, you get, uh, uh, 20% off coupon for our sponsor, which is skulls shop S K U L L S H O P P E. And this is one of their little skulls. I can't find the jaws over there. I can't, I can't get it right now. Oh, wait, I'll get it. This is a child skull, I believe. Or an adolescent skull. Oh, no, this is, <laughs> this is the job for the, for the adult female. <laughs> so it doesn't quite fit, but I like that. <laughs> this gives me a painting idea. Anyway, really amazing skulls. S-K-U-L-L-S-H-O-P-P-E dot com skull shop and uh, if you join at the five dollar or above level you get a 20 percent discount and their skulls are really worth it they really are totally i've got a real skull and if i put it next to my uh, my skull shop skull you wouldn't be able to tell the difference you, really they're, they're that good anyway um okay uh new subs new subscribers we got one new subscriber this week and i want to just read uh read his name in the air and thank him Okay, Chad Keith, thank you so much uh, for supporting. Really appreciate it. Couldn't do it without you. Um, I think that's it. We'll just get on with the interview now. Uh, again, if you're on, if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. I would really love you for that. Um, okay. Anyway, let's get on with this uh, interview. Super fun. Ryan Peterson, amazing person, and uh, Exorcist, amazing film. So. Here we go, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello, Ryan. Welcome Hi, back Jeff. to the show. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. We didn't. We didn't do. A... You had a two-parter last time, didn't you? Yeah, I think it was uh, 2018. Wow. That long ago? Wow. Pre pandemic. I think it was. We were, yeah, we were during the pandemic and I had just been um, uh, given test, attested uh, the day I talked to you. So, yeah, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. So, wow. Weird. And, we, and I saw on the news that um, uh, some of the, the uh, COVID cases are on the rise again. I know. So, another what reason, the hell? another reason <laughs> to not leave the house. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, like, I need a reason. Uh, <laughs> so yeah uh for for those who don't if you don't haven't heard the 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 uh ryan peterson interview before the two that we did go and check them out they're amazing um ryan is a as a genius artist um amazing i you know i say genius a lot but i have a lot of geniuses on the show <laughs> it's oh. like there's, there's a lot of people that i really consider geniuses and I feel like I'm overusing it, but it's like, it really does apply to you. And, and, and I think it applies to you and it applies. You're right. I mean, we're, look how lucky we are. We've worked with, uh, I mean, is there any doubt that someone like Rick Baker is, is a genius or Mitch Devane or Matt Rose? I mean, these guys are Kazu. Kazu. Yeah. I mean, go on and Steve on. Wang, like, most, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Steve, just everyone you've had on your show. So yeah. Well, wow, it's a treat. It really is. And, uh, it's a treat yeah, for me. Unfortunately, it's unfortunately, you know, we're losing some of those people now. And did you hear Denise? Uh, Lady Bear just passed away, the right. hair girl. Denise. Uh, the work that worked with us at, at Rick's. Um, and uh, yeah, that she just passed away, I, I heard yesterday. Oh, no, I can't think of who that is. What was her last uh, name? It's, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Lady Bear? Huh. Lady Bear? And uh, yeah, I probably, I'm sure, kind. yeah, I'm sure I would know her if I saw her. There was a lot of people working there. Wow, really? that, yeah, that's it's yeah. it's crazy. All these, you know, we, we Dave, lost, Smith. Dave, we lost Smith, Dave Smith, Moto, Moto, Matt, Matt, Rose, Rose, now oh, Denise. I mean, it's like, uh, it's, Brent Baker, Brent Baker, yeah, it's, it's crazy, crazy. 
Well, yeah. what a way, what a way to start the podcast off. <laughs> well, it, a, a lot of this is we lost Friedkin, you know, we lost William. Friedkin. True, true. You're right. So it's, it's a perfect way to, to, to start the yeah. podcast. Yeah. So, so anyway, check out the interviews with Ryan and get more background on him. This episode was uh ryan's idea he wanted to talk about the exorcist and um uh, and it's one of my favorite movies one of my favorite directors and uh i thought it was a great idea uh you brought this up before friedkin died yeah and 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 i texted ryan i was like hey friedkin just died at 89 so maybe we should talk about the exorcist kind of in in honor of him and yes. um and so i would love to talk about the exorcist i mean it's amazing I, I watched it again you know this yeah, weekend so which versions did you see i, I you know I, I didn't get a chance to watch the original but i've seen it so many times i watched yeah. the the extended the, the, the director's cut which mm -hmm. i don't think i liked as much as the original cut yeah even though it's it's like it wasn't you know it wasn't so different that it was like oh this is a totally different movie but um I don't know. It seemed a little, a little long, I guess, you know, I enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it though. What did you think? Cause I know you said you had a strong opinion about the, the director's cut and I know you have a lot of strong opinions. <laughs> well, I, I, I caught it at man's Chinese theater. I was working in LA at the time and I think Steve Koch and Eddie Yang and I went and saw it. And, um, I was so depressed when I walked out of the really? theater. I felt betrayed. I, um, I I was baffled because Friedkin did things. Like, if it's not broken, don't try to fix it. Yeah. He did things that I was really surprised at. Um, like the, and I uh, tried to... Face superimposed on All the... the ridiculous subliminal stuff that he just, he, he used too much. Yeah. And um, there was, you know, there was that ridiculous... Uh, uh, Eileen Dietz, you know, makeup test, uh, Captain mm -hmm. Howdy, that that was so well done in the original movie because it was just seen in flashes, right? And then you see it just kind of emerge on top of like the oven vent. <laughs> you know, so it's like, that's that 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 is like the most. That's almost like satire. I know it was really strange. It was really strange. Uh, yeah, and 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 when you have a classic, like, can you? Like, I've watched after uh, I watched the French Connection again. Cause, cause, um, mm -hmm. uh, Fritz, my son hadn't seen it and he's, uh, he's oh, kind of a yeah. movie buff and he was, he was, uh, we were talking about Chinatown cause he loves, we both love Chinatown and, I um, do too. and I was like, you gotta see the French connection. Cause it's kind of, you know, in the, in this, in the same area, even though it's a period piece. Um, but, um, the, the Chinatown is, uh, and so I watched that and, um, uh, you know, imagine, reissuing and and adding stuff like that to french connection <laughs> it's like you just wouldn't do that or no. chinatown or something or the wizard no. of oz or something <laughs> anything i don't think i like any version that like whether it's star wars or et or anything where the director went back and tinkered with it yeah i mean i did and i so i liked the you know there was the uh i think there was extended scenes in the doctor's office yeah you know and that was i liked that i liked watching it you know it just seemed like it was mostly the stuff that um i thought was weird was with those funky uh uh superimpositions of yeah subliminal shots and um the spider walk down the stairs was kind of cool but you know the blood comes out of her mouth do you remember that Oh yeah, but I like the one that they cut out is the one I really like, where she flips over and she sticks her tongue out, and it's that weird curly tongue. Have you ever seen that? And they didn't. Oh. That was like a totally different version. It is so oh. creepy. I don't think I've seen that. Oh my god, she's like she runs and and they didn't. I think they didn't use it because they couldn't get rid of the the rig, and oh, okay. um, and it kind of looked like she was floating. You know, she wasn't really running so much like her hands and feet weren't really touching the stairs and um she kind of like is running backwards and then she flips over on all fours mm. like a dog and then she mm. she looks she's looking at the camera and she goes 
and it's this like weird curly tongue that Ooh, darts yeah. in and out and then she runs on all fours i think it's to that uh assistant the secretary woman maybe or maybe it was uh alan burston but she goes like running towards her and just kind of like bumps into her like a dog starting that tongue out and it, and and it's like you can see it on youtube it's it's like grainy because they i guess they didn't feel like they could even use it so it's kind of I like i think i have oh. seen it yeah i think it was probably in some of the behind the scenes yeah and, and yeah stuff. anyway i thought that yeah. was, that was great and i was kind of expecting that at that part and i'd never seen the part where the blood came out of the mouth anyway tangent well that's not a bad scene and it's not yeah. like i disliked some of the stuff that was added i liked i liked the um the little dialogue between Marin and Karis right in the middle of the exorcism when they're on the stairs mm -hmm. and he asks him what, you know, what's this all about? And, and Marin says, you know, to, it's to make us uh, seem unworthy mm -hmm. for the love of God that we're like more beast. And um, that was good. But what, what I think Friedkin was doing pretty sure he was accommodating his friend, William Peter Blatty. Oh, maybe. Because Blatty, when he saw the first cut that Friedkin prepared for him for, for The Exorcist, it had that scene that I we just mentioned on the stairway. And I think it had some of the doctor office scenes. Friedkin loved it. He thought it was perfect, a masterpiece. And But then Friedkin, who was in in the zone, <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was on another level of... of of uh intuition mm -hmm. and uh he went back and he cut some of those and but I, and i know because i've seen discussions footage of, of blatty and freak and talking and it's really interesting they're both so smart so creative I, I could listen to them all day but uh they talked about various things um uh, about the movie blatty things that he wished freak had kept in mm -hmm. And, and then Friedkin responding, uh, you know, what his reasoning was. And, uh, and I, and, you know, don't get me wrong. I love William Peter Blatty. Uh, I had him sign my copy of the book. Oh, really? Um, I, he was at, he was signing copies at Dark Delicacies. Oh, wow. And I was, this was like, uh, this was 25 years ago. Had him sign it and I hadn't read the book. And so I thought, this is, this, I'm going to read it. <laughs> And real quick, <laughs> I was more scared to read the book than see the movie <laughs> uh, because a friend of mine in the effects industry, I won't say who he was, <laughs> but he was he was in the Navy. And he said he, while he was reading the book, he was in a, he was in the uh, the oh, in the sleeping quarters on, on the lower bunk bed and he was reading The Exorcist and it was just him and a guy above him that were the only ones in the room because he could hear the, the guy above him sleeping, making, you know, snorting and sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so he was reading it and I guess he had finished reading and he went to go check on the guy above him and there was no one there. Oh my so God. The sounds, he said the sounds <laughs> were like that of like snorting and, and kind of like kind of, if he wasn't there would have been terrifying. Wow. And he told me that story, and you know, Chet, I've heard this something like this before. Another friend of mine, and it always seems to happen when the individual is distracted and makes an assumption. Mm -hmm. So this person was was reading the book, he was distracted, and he made an assumption that someone was above him, only to realize <laughs> that there wasn't. And then I have another friend who, when he was in high school, he and his brother were in the house alone, his brother was downstairs. Um, oh no, his brother was in the house, and and my friend was talking to somebody on the phone in his bedroom with the lights turned off, and his door was shut with just a little bit of light um, breaking through. Mm -hmm. You know, just kind of like that slit the door will when it's not completely closed. And he said his brother was teasing him and distracting him because he could see his brother's shadow interrupting that beam of light coming through the door. And he was making <laughs> like pig sounds. Weird, oh my God. Stuff. And, and my friends had, you know, was saying, stop it, knock it off. I'm on the phone. And, and it stopped for a minute and then it would return. And he could see that beam of light being interrupted again. And this time 
he quickly slammed down the phone, went to go grab grab his brother, you know, what brothers do, and probably wail on him for a bit. And no one was in the hallway. Oh and then he God. he called out to his brother, and his brother was all the way downstairs of their house, and he couldn't have made that that journey from his outside his bedroom to the downstairs in the amount of time it took him to slam the phone down and get, and open the door. And I, so these stories are kind of similar. Well, let, my, I, let me interject and you can continue. But my, yes. my, my mom had a story like that to where she was taking some folded clothes to my brother's room and she went to open the door to put the clothes in his room and the door, he, she said he, he said, sorry, and he shut the door on her. And she was like, oh, that's weird. And then apparently he walked up the, a few minutes later, he walked up the front, uh, through the front door, like he wasn't even in the room. He was outside somewhere down the street. Wow. And uh, again, it was like, she just thought he was being kind of rude or, and weird. And uh, so that's- She, just, made, she made an assumption. Yeah, it exactly. It's, <laughs> it's very similar. It seems like those, see, it seems like, paranormal stuff happens when you're not thinking about it and when that's why you make the assumption because you're not even thinking like that when you're when you're trying to think of it and you want it to happen that's when it never happens <laughs> it never happens exactly <laughs> it has to it has to occur sideways right you know, it can't it can never happen directly right and uh, so anyway oh, that... so 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 that just reminded me of that story too so so very well, very similar yeah and so of course i had that anecdote my friend had in the navy uh right when i started to read the book <laughs> and i was like oh can i get through this and okay the first day <laughs> nothing happened okay Quick, quickly got through it and my reaction was kind of uh, different than i had expected i loved the book and it wasn't so much scary i didn't i i felt the subtext was about a crisis of faith mm -hmm. and and it was all about uh Karis, the Karis character his 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 uh, crisis of faith mm -hmm. and and not being able to well basically whether or not he believed in god right and and so i felt i thought it was one of the most compassionate books i ever read because mm -hmm. that's that was the subtext right. that was the main thing and and so when I finished, I was like, wow, that wasn't scary. It was interesting, but it was very touching to me. Hmm. And so back to Blatty, have you seen the ninth configuration? No, but I have thought about it in the last month or so. For some reason, I, I saw hmm. it and um, I saw someone mention it on YouTube or something. And I was like, hmm. oh, I got to see this. I've never seen it. So is it is it good? I, it's I got religious we themes also in it. From, from... Well, sort of. It, it. I was I was working at Rick's on. I think we you were there too. We were. I think it was on the Grinch, or Men in Black Two. And Matt Rose, <laughs> we were talking about maybe we we're talking about the Exorcist or Blatty, and he says he asked me, "Have you ever seen the Ninth Configuration?" I said, "Oh," and he he brought in the, his VHS copy in the next day, and he says, "Here you go. Be warned. It's got the longest." Uh, bar scene and history <laughs> at the end it just keep going on and on and on he said and i was like huh but he said it's really really good and so i watched it and it, it really kind of it's based on his book uh twinkle twinkle killer came right and um yeah i researched Vladdy, it i researched it and looked it up on yeah he he did write and direct this right and and it's it again it's it's it touched me like the book the exorcist because hmm. uh the, the scott wilson character is probably blatty's surrogate of the movie the actress scott wilson plays the the protagonist and he he's an astronaut who who at the last minute feigns um he has a breakdown and, and then he joins this uh like it looks like this chateau in in the in in, in the mountains of washington and it would have been this old castle where a bunch of uh, Vietnamese uh, vets who are claiming they've gone crazy, kind of like um, what Nicholson's character did in, in um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm -hmm. They were all there, and they're going to be studied by a psychologist, a psychologist played by Stacey Keach, to see 
who was feigning being crazy and who was legitimately crazy, you know, because they would do that to get out of the war. Mm-hmm. And and so Scott Wilson's character had a legitimate breakdown just prior. He played an astronaut going uh, going to the moon, and he the, there's dialogue in the movie between him and the psychologist who comes in who joins the compound, played by Stacy Keach. And it's very much about things that actually I'm very concerned about, you know, the nature of suffering and 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 and, and life after death. Everyone's concerned about this, right. not just me. But he did he did talk about animals. And what about animal suffering? And that was where I hadn't I haven't heard very much dialogue in movies where they actually get into the suffering of animals. Damn, they, I gotta see do, this movie. Yeah, and it just, I thought, whoa. And then it was a Scott Wilson character, and I, I related to him so much because I just love that dialogue. And basically, it, it's it's Blatty. These right. are the preoccupations of Blatty, who I sense is a very compassionate person. Mm-hmm. He was. He passed away a long ago. But So back to Friedkin and Blatty. Blatty, it's apples and oranges. Blatty had a movie in mind. And Freakin had a movie in mind. And and something very interesting happened that when the baton was passed from Blatty to Freakin, uh, uh, the, the material changed, but not in a bad way. It right. was just, it became apples and oranges. And, like and, the Shining. And Freakin, yeah, yes, yes, good example. And, and uh, Freakin's approach was very appropriate for a movie for, to mm-hmm. he wanted it to be totally realistic yeah and 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 so there was nothing um fanciful to distract you f- to uh, lighten the material so just like a documentary go in there and just yep. kind of hit you over the head with it and 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 Friedkin is a you know I've read his book his autobiography I've, I've seen most I think I've seen most of his movies He's, I've listened to every podcast I, I could um, because he's such an interesting person and he a complicated person. Yeah. Smart as hell. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and maybe prickly, you know, I, I, I've heard that. Uh, and and even, he even acknowledges it in his book. But I kind of think that approach was necessary for for the movie adaptation. Whereas I think Blatty would have maybe cushioned it a little bit with, uh, and, and, and Friedkin even acknowledges this in that leap of faith documentary that, mm-hmm. that Blatty provided him with a, a, a screenplay that was, that deviated too far from his book. Right. And so Friedkin just wanted to streamline it and get the essence of the book and treat it realistically. And I think that was such a smart way to go. And so, that baton being passed from Blatty to Friedkin is fascinating because it's like, and and we'll get into this. I I, uh, I, I think Friedkin was in a zone where he was connected to the art god, and yeah. he mentions this in that leap of faith. He called it the movie god. Yeah, and and I've called it. We've talked about this before. I call it the muse or the whisperer. Right. Whatever, whatever is out there that collaborates us when we have a good idea and mm-hmm. helps us. I don't know what to call it, to be honest. I, I, I call it, I call it the whisper, but it doesn't have the gravitas. Yeah. So it's like the art spirit. It's like the yeah, mystery. It's, 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 it's the thing. It's like every artist knows what it is, but it's not easily named, you know? No. But, 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 but you, you know, people say stuff like the movie gods or the art gods. And that's the well, one of the the coolest things about that uh, leap of faith documentary is is um, how he was talking about like that first shot um, or that where it fades in on a black and white sun mm-hmm. and then it goes to color, and he mm-hmm. was saying I just did it because I thought it was cool. It basically is what he was saying. Uh, he was saying I just intuitively he's like there's not a meaning there. Because after I watched this like critique of it, I started watching it. I turned it off because I was like, this is bullshit. Because <laughs> some guy was like, okay, the, I think the black and white, is, I mean, it's cool because it's interesting to critique work and, and give your interpretations of it. But he's like, I think the black and white was like, what did he say? 
uh, turning to color, it was, I forgot what he said, the black, he thought the black and white meant, but turning to color was like going into the fiery depths of hell. And he just was putting all this meaning onto these things that in the Leap of Faith documentary, Friedkin was like, I he kept saying that I was, I was just following my intuition and it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean anything, but I knew it was right for the film. And, mm -hmm. and, and I so related to that with, with painting, you know, it's like, especially with the stuff I do is like, not, I don't think about it logically, not beyond trying to make it look well painted or, or you know, following muscle structure and things like that and getting the sh shadows right and the values right. Uh, but, but just knowing when something is right. And, and and recognizing it when you see it mm -hmm. is like such an important part of the um the art making process and the thing i really came away from uh away with from that documentary was like he was you know treating that he was being an artist when he was making that film you know mm -hmm. it's like yeah. filmmaking is such a technical art form that a lot of filmmakers aren't considered artists. And I think probably a lot of them maybe aren't really artists, <laughs> uh, but, but he was real. I really felt like he was an artist after saying that. I was like, this is an artist making an art piece, this film, just yeah. because, just because of that approach really. Yeah. You know, and do you know how rare that is to right. be given that kind of budget and that, that amount of power and this was in the 70s that was the so. old days <laughs> that's when yes, they that the was like days, when the they 70s. used to do that when you could go over budget and take twice <laughs> as long on the movie and get in a fight with the you know argue your for your with the, the head of the studio for your actor <laughs> that you wanted it's like yeah. it's so cool and all those amazing movies that still stand the test of time came out of that era and it's like, look at all the shit that we have now. <laughs> it's, you know, it's so, there's just like, how often does a movie like that come along that will be talked about in 20, 30, 40 years? Oh, yeah. You know, it, you know they they blame Michael Cimino for Heaven's Gate. He, everyone references that movie as the end of the auteur. Oh, period. really? He, it was, he went way over budget. It was self-indulgent, three-hour movie, huge bomb. And the studios went, well, uh, uh, uh. Can't do that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a paradigm shift. And I think also Jaws and Star Wars kind of contributed to that right. momentum yeah. and direction shift as well. But uh, yeah, freaking, freaking, uh, man, his, and he, okay, I, I heard Bob Dylan say something once, and I hear it actually from a lot of musicians and songwriters. And he said when he was young, he, he just the it just flowed from him, the the songs, the writing. He's just almost like just transcribing it. Mm -hmm. It was coming out so fast. He says, I I don't know what it and this was him as an older person. He said, I don't know what it was. I don't I don't think I could do it again. Right. It just, I saw that interview. It was like yeah, 60 minutes I mean, or something. Yeah. And he was like, I, I, he's like, I couldn't do that again. <laughs> but isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Because that's he was I, I this is what i'm thinking he was collaborating with the art god for sure and and you're young and your your essence your 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 light is bright and it's like you're at your peak of of possibility you know and 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 freaking was young when he did the exorcist mm -hmm. and and the timing was right and and that's another thing uh timing I, time 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 I think that is the medium of the art god. So, so if the art god's going to uh, collaborate with an artist, it does so with time, and and sometimes that little I, I, I envision it as a box, and sometimes that box is small and you don't have a lot of time, and and it flows out, and and then other times it's it's a little more labored, and Tom waits said this too he said sometimes the the this the musician the songwriter he's saying sometimes the the songs come easily and sometimes they don't mm -hmm. and it's it, and it takes time and i think what what freaking created in 1973 
was unique in its time and place. So when he went in 2000 and decided to tinker with it, for one, the art god was no longer collaborating with him because his instincts were terrible. Right. To put a subliminal Captain Howdy head on that that oven bed, what the hell? And then he put he put the mom uh, image on the curtains as Keros was jumping right. out the window again. It's like we don't need any visual that, distractions that, that, from just the purity of that moment. That 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 is when you see something like that, you can tell that's a human decision based yeah. on intellect and like what what conscious yeah conscious intention concern. yeah it's like uh maybe you know there's a difference between logically working something out and thinking something through and just knowing when something is right and, and, and intuitively uh approaching it and you can tell you can tell it's yeah. like it's with music it's with art art it's with all all of the arts you can yes. you can tell when it's de, gen you know you want to I wanted to say, yeah when I want I wanted to say divinely inspired but if you're not of that uh you know persuasion but you could why I not would, I mean why I not say that yeah you know I, I, I art god yeah, yeah yeah I mean I I have no problem with it but you know how people are with uh people are just so you know anything people are so down on religion now that that well it, I almost would say this isn't religion this is spiritual right, it's almost mystical. Right. Right, so, but you, there's like a there's a lot of hardcore atheists that just want to say that everything ma everything's dumb matter and you know I don't believe that you don't believe that so so anyway that's a that's a side point but I want uh, this reminded me of this something I've been thinking about lately totally okay. separate from from uh, the Exorcist I was thinking that okay it's like you have this you have this overarching art god thing that we don't know what to call it it's this thing yeah. though it is something and i was thinking like different genres of art or different art forms are almost like sub gods yes and and then below that you've got the genres of those Ooh. of those different art forms and there's like they're like sub sub gods and it's and 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 when you are trying to create a piece of artwork you are trying to embody like an like in a magical sense you're trying to embody the art god you're kind of calling it into you in the way that through you know magical processes you can do this you know it's like you can if you need to be a good order you can call on this certain god that is good at speaking and, and you do a ritual and, and you call it into you and, and blah blah and it's like when you do that with artwork as well and the same goes with like genres it's like you there's a there's an embod a perfect embodiment of different genres like flower paintings <laughs> you know yeah. there's a way of doing that that's truly inspired to where you're embodying the spirit of root paintings or flower paintings and then there's like the dark art stuff where it's like you're embodying that spirit it's it's the best way to put it and and it's like if you if you allow yourself to be taken over by this by these gods or spirits or whatever you want to call them you will get inspired work this is how you get the great great artwork is is by totally embodying these spirits and it's really just a way of talking about it. And it sounds like, I don't know, airy fairy or something or fly, no, flighty yeah. or something, but it's like, that's the best way I could, I could oh. think to describe it, it really. Cause it feels like that. You said it, you described it so well. That was so good. Yeah. Don't absolutely. you think it's true? I agree with everything you said because, um, it's like the punk rock music God, there is a punk rock music God. And if yes. you embody it, you make this amazing, music yeah. that fits in this genre you know and it's like but you're also embodying the gods above it that are related at the same time mm -hmm. it's really a weird trippy thing because you're you're embodying the main art god but then you're embodying this subgenre and the sub music and then the subgenre of like punk rock or mm -hmm. classical music or whatever you know y yeah you're so right i i just love that and i i agree totally um, and, and, you know, uh, scientists have their little uh, science God, because totally, anytime yeah. you, 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 
need a, a problem solved or some some kind of inspiration. I think there is a commensurate art or God to help right. you. Writing, you, um, it, I mean, I, I I told you last time I was on your podcast how I wrote some screenplays, and I definitely felt a different mode taking over. And so I was no longer communicating, and it didn't happen immediately. I, I think these art gods have to wait. They wait and see if you're serious. Right. And if you, if you put in the time, then they go, okay. This Chet. is exactly, okay, okay. <laughs> go oh, ahead, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'll I was just going to say, okay, Chet's been working on this. The art gods look at say, he's taking this serious. I'm going to use him as a vest. I'm, we're going to collaborate now. And and then something happens. And then you you become... I don't like to say vessel because it's a collaboration and then you create something right and you can create something pure. And, and so when writing, I started getting writing ideas, but it, it wasn't immediate. I had to get into it. Right. And I can demonstrate that I was taking it serious again, time. Yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah. it's a time element. You, you have to have a good relationship or an understandable and forgiving relationship with time. And that is why, you know, Rick Baker used to get, in nine months to do Harry and the Hendersons. And then they kept whittling down yeah. the time. And eventually, eventually, not that this happened to Rick, but that the mediocre, the left, the bar drops. Right. And, and mediocrity starts to take over. And it's all because of this devaluation of time. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you're going to say something I can tell. Yeah. It's so crazy that, uh, if you relate to what you're saying to, uh, traditional ceremonial magic practice and stuff, you know, they say there's different gods and goddesses that you can work with to get, if you feel called to, or if you feel like you want them to help you with something. Yeah. And, um, what, what they, what they say is you can't just call on the God when you need something, you know, and expect to get a result. Um, you can, if you're going to do it, you have to kind of commit to them and put the time yes. in and show that you are honoring them and like create an altar for them and have some little trinkets for them, lighting, a, light a candle for them. And it's like, if you're serious about it, it's just like calling that art God or calling the muse. It's like, it's the same thing. It's like, you have to show mm -hmm. that you're serious about it and that you're willing to put the time in and form a relationship with that God yes. or goddess. And it's the same thing with that art spirit. It's like, you know, you can't just sit down and, you know, start drawing and just make a masterpiece. It's like, if you want to collaborate with that thing, it's not going to, if you think about it, why would some great master artist want to collaborate with someone that's not willing to put the time in mm -hmm. like a, like a mentor or a person, if, if you're mm -hmm. not serious about it enough to put the time in, it's like that with the art God thing, you know, you're so right. You got to have some, you got to have a reverence for the process. And the process is a discipline and mm -hmm. you've got time as part of that. And um, uh, I didn't know if I wanted to get into it. AI. This, but AI. <laughs> I knew it was well, going to come up. Yeah, we don't need to get into it too much. You're probably so sick of it. But uh, <laughs> but it violates what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> on, a, on a totally side note, I saw today this amazing AI stuff that this guy was making. And it's like... You know, what I've come to discover in myself is like the way I feel about it is that's amazing. It, they looked like paintings and it was clearly an amalgamation of all these great painters like Brahm and the end. All the great painters that are contemporary that the data scraped up. You could just tell. Yeah. And, I, you know, what I was thinking was when I think this every time I see a really good piece of AI art, I'm like, that's super cool. But I got. I got no respect for you as an artist. I don't disrespect you as an artist, but I don't think that, you know, that I think, wow, the program's amazing. I don't think, wow, the person that made that's amazing. No. <laughs> it's like, it just is not this. That's, I just, so, so I feel that way with uh, a lot of uh, pretty much most AI art is like, unless you're really working with it and we've had this discussion before privately if you're really working with the ai and you're changing it yourself and you're bringing it into photoshop and you might be printing it out and painting on it and really collaborating with it okay i can see i don't i wouldn't find that satisfying myself 
but I could see where that could be an extension of collaborating with the art God, but that requires artist knowledge of art and knowing how to put things together and how to collage things in Photoshop and how to paint in Photoshop and how to, you know, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, we don't need to get. There's a process. Yeah, there has to be some kind of because the pr process. It, the process yeah. is is the art. It's the process it's is the art. It's the the piece that you come up with is the uh, artifact of a mm -hmm. process. It's not exactly. the main thing. It's the main thing to to us because and collect. It's, it's the main thing to us because we can sell it and earn a living and collectors can collect it. But what they're collecting is an artifact of a process that happened. And for us that are really into art making, it's all about the process. And it's for me anyway, it's like, it's all about the process. I, and I'm, and it's satisfying when you create something great, but I don't sit and stare at it after for years. Yeah. It's like, I enjoy looking at it that, Oh, I did it. That was fun. It was hard. It took me, it was like a journey. And, and I got, and I did it. And once it's done, it's not like I'm just married to the piece anymore. It's like, I want to make, do the process again. Cause that's what I love is the process conceptualizing. Yeah. That's fun. That's the fun part. Looking at it in the end is not the fun part and not the reason I do it. It's, it's for yeah. the process. It's, it's a, it's a way to live. It's a life. It's, it's an ethos. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what we, I think, um, artists are that's we're that's how we're destined to live and if we it, you know i i felt it early on when i i knew i had some ability and it's just like okay i'm going to be an artist and i don't think i have a choice and so i was always comfortable with spending hours and hours alone yeah <laughs> and and not going out and and it was it was the most comfortable thing in the world for me and it still is mm -hmm. so so it's it's an, an ethic an ethos that that i think um some people may not who don't have the luxury of being creative but people that weren't meant to probably don't quite understand and that's okay yeah i can't yeah. understand what it would be like to be a mathematician i was gonna say that's what i was gonna say yeah. a mathematician <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, i appreciate it though i think mathematics is amazing i appreciate and it's like it. i was yes. I, and I, I even think like i wish i could do that i wish i understood it but I'm just not, my mind is, not, I'm not suited to it. I'm just not. It's not what it. our vehicles was designed for. Right. Yeah. We're not. And um, yeah, what was I going to say? Oh, AI. Yeah. Um, so I guess if someone was really willing to uh, involve an algorithm into their process and make room for uh, the art God to collaborate, more power to them. Right. But I don't know how you do that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 it gets, you're still relinquishing a certain amount of labor to technology mm -hmm. and, and, and it does it fast. And, and so I don't know, I, I, I don't want to begrudge anyone who, who finds real satisfaction. Yeah. In, Cause some people are doing amazing stuff with it, you know? It, yeah. So I say more, more power to you. Um, but it's not for me and, and it doesn't, it doesn't reflect any of my, um, Values. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Enough of the AI. Let's get back to. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to come up. It's so funny. Uh, okay. So so yeah. It, so anyway, I just want to get back and close the close it on um, the the special edition because that I felt like was I felt betrayed coming out of seeing that uh, and it and it was pretty much because I didn't get the feeling that. I didn't see the fingerprints of the muse in it, right. the art god, like I did in the original. Definitely. And it's like what you're saying. It was it was something conscious that that Friedkin was doing to accommodate his friend, right? William Peter Blatty, the person who wrote it. And and I think that's a very generous thing to do. Right, right, right. But it's but it, it was a violation to me. Yeah, and, and, and because it, yeah, to it, him maybe it was like I already made, made. It's just like you know John Carpenter making not very good movies later in his life you know it's like I, sometimes i think you know let them make some money because 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 i've known people that worked with them and 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 said that he was kind of like on set for these movies some of these later movies that weren't very good it's kind of like you know this john is, carpenter yeah he like oh. this is my you know i'm gonna take this is my vacation money or whatever you know like he's finally making yeah. some money and 
Um, you know, this guy made these amazing movies with no money. Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween, oh, The Fog, all these, The Thing, all these masterpieces, him. overlooked, underappreciated. Um, I don't begrudge him for cashing in at the end. He deserves that. You know, so maybe, so in a sense, I could say Friedkin saying like, you know what? I gave you this amazing movie, The Exorcist. If I want to mess with it, even if it's just to help my friend out, I'm going to do that. Or of like yeah. make some more money or whatever. Cause it seemed to me maybe like a cash grab, if anything, you know, the, I don't the, know. The problem with that is it, it kind of uh, contaminates the response. So I, a lot of people will favor the, um, the special edition. And I even heard oh, really? Quentin, Tar Quentin Tarantino loved the special edition. He even played it at his theater. Is huh. it the, Bever the new Beverly, whatever it, it, theater he, and he was praising it. And, and I was like, what? I love Quentin Tarantino, but it was the first time that I really disagreed with him. Hmm. And and so it it kind of contaminates the 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 collective reaction because now people are some people have no problems with the special edition. And and I'm thinking, well, why not? <laughs> well, <laughs> wait, and they're confused. And it's like, wait a minute, don't you see the difference? Uh and, I mean, there were so many things that that the special edition I felt violated. It even interrupted the prologue in Iraq. Right. I mean, there was a bit, there was a little uh, like a symbolic image of, a, of an right. angel sculpture or something. And it's like the beauty of the Iraq prologue was that it, it kind of disoriented the audience. It's like, Wait yeah, a minute, yeah, it's yeah. A movie you know, we wanted to see. Yeah. And then, and it and it turned out to be this. I think it's some of the best parts of the whole movie. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk. Let's get to the main Exorcist and get off okay. of the special the, the director's the director's cut because uh, good. You know, <laughs> that's the, the the what we wanted to talk about anyway. Yeah, that that uh that whole scene in Iraq. It's like you know, it's I never until I watched um I heard some commentary you did and watched Fear itself. It's like uh, or well, not Fear itself uh. Leap of Leap Faith of documentary. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I never, it never stood out to me as like, oh, this doesn't make sense that like some people were kind of saying, but to me, it makes perfect sense. Like it felt like the, it, it, the perfect thing for that film. It's, it's, even though it's not obvious, it's like, it's not obviously relating specifically or, or clearly telling you what it means to me it was mm -hmm. like oh it's like the sense of foreboding it's him encountering this this statue of this demon and him kind of going uh, you could just tell that like totally. it, it, it was a feeling and, the, and then and i was so happy to to hear him talking about how he was trying to capture a feeling when intuitively he kept seeing all this cool stuff in iraq when he was there and he's like i gotta shoot this like the you know, like the guys hammering that metal, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. ding. That was so cool. And then the guy turned with his eye. I mean, you couldn't, so cool. you couldn't make that up. That's what I want to say. You couldn't make that up. Cause that's one of those things that like you see organically and go, oh, we got to shoot that. And the guy probably had a weird eye or something, <laughs> you know? And, you know, he freaking was freaking in that leap of faith he said he he always admired surrealists and he felt like yeah that, that was, was the other cool did. thing that he was... but the prologue was very surreal it was an act he was acting like an abstract right. artist yeah it was it, it was an abstraction and i think that's why a lot of people don't connect with it because it's like it's not it's not your typical kind of storytelling it's like just a bunch yeah. of almost little images and imagery and, and, and it doesn't it's not filling any plot points and it's, it's like so creepy and cool it viol totally violates any of the screenwriting rules right and structured nowadays and it's like if a, if a, a studio screenwriter a script reader if they were to read the exorcist they you know the pro they would probably throw it out and right. put it on the, the pile after five minutes because it's like wait this is i don't see any story moving forward yeah i think blatty and, took that out of his initial screenplay too and he wanted it back in i think is what yes said. yeah freaking said put it back in yeah and it's so smart and you're right he uh he was very intuitive and uh he was so intuitive throughout all of it and uh that that iraq sequence is just amazing to me and i love i love the image of Marin and 
Pazuzu. I know it's so cool. Standing, facing off, yeah. and, and then the dogs. And then, oh, the dogs are so. And yeah. that blue sky behind Pazuzu. I mean, it's just amazing. amazing. Inspired. It's, it's inspired. Yeah. It's like you don't. That's what I. I uh, you know, like like again, it's like you can tell when something's inspired, and you can tell when something's contrived. Yeah. And none, nothing in that was contrived. It was. It, yep. it all felt very inspired. And that's like that's that's what uh, great art is all about. Music, whatever. It's like you can tell. You can just tell when it's inspired. You can, you can tell when it's contrived. You know. What I, what I worry about is that a lot of filmmakers and artists, anyway, are not. I don't know. I I, I just look at films and I, I I just don't see the kind of quality that we had when we were growing up. And I'm, and I'm just wondering if you know the the art the inner artist is never allowed to um, spread their wings. It's yeah, always they're not uh, given the time like you're. They're not given about. time. They're not they're not given um, final cut. They're not allowed to follow their instincts, and because it it, it gets in the realm of uh, instability to them because they're the, the studio and the, the producers they're they're quantifying things. Okay, they, this this budget is this much and you're yeah. eating up this much time and they don't understand and i can understand this it, it'd be hard to relate to someone like friedkin who's who says i i've got to have jason miller in, right. in the exercise i i mean and that in of itself is amazing and you're we're going to have to pay off stacy keach and yeah. i want to go with this unknown can you imagine a studio allowing a, a director to do that now yeah yeah and, and i think jason miller is kind of to me he's kind of like the heart of the movie and he's yeah. the surrogate for Blatty. Yep. So he, to me, he's the most unusual and satisfying part of that whole movie because I'd never seen him before. Yeah. And he was hundred percent believable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, it, and you know, I think that the, I think what happened with uh, the studios is they were all, they've all been bought out by big corporations instead of yeah. like, you know, and there was problems with the old studio system for sure. But, but can you, you you know you're not you're not, you, I can't imagine like a bunch of bankers and bean counters at Sony letting some artists follow you know even understanding the idea about the art god and thinking it's a real yeah. thing it's like people like that are just like not it, it, they don't they 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 don't have they only they they're only trusting people that um have made money before and that's it thank you um i just got some iced coffee sorry oh yeah no lisa you're, you're me, right lisa brought me some iced you know. coffee um yeah so it's so it's like you know they're basing it exclusively on how much money they've made before and and yep. that's it <laughs> very shallow conscious materialistic greedy values and when and that's when it comes to art that's like the last thing you should be yeah, thinking tips. about yes Yes, that's the problem with Making money art, and yeah. art. You yeah. know, that's it. It just the two are incompatible, basically. You um, have to keep them you separate, know, and, and you can't can. have financial considerations when you're making the art. And then mm -hmm. marketing the art is almost like a separate thing that you have. I, as an independent artist, I have to do it. So yes. I try and keep it like yeah. as a separate thing, its own thing, and then I focus on the marketing as a, as its own little thing. But I don't think it, every time i've tried to think in terms of what would sell what will people like instead of that. instead of what do i think would be really cool that's what that's, that's what awesome. when i make my best stuff is when i think when i'm excited about it and i hope that and you hope that your fans will also be excited about it you know absolutely yeah i totally agree yeah you know there was an exception though uh alan ladd jr was the head of i guess it was 20th century fox mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was he had he had he was like the caesar you know thumbs up thumbs down on productions and star wars was a highly unusual creation too mm -hmm. yeah um lucas at the time was just he was just kind of no one got what he was trying to do and and yet a couple people at the top of the studio Alan Ladd Jr. was one of them. Says, "I'm going to trust the talent, and 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 let it happen." And he let Star Wars be. Yeah. And 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 it was. See, Star Wars was so influential to all of us and oh, to yeah. me and everything. And because it was, 
Yeah, it's kind of it 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 it's kind of derives from some of uh, uh you know the uh, Joseph Campbell stuff and and archetypes and and structure myth. That's okay. Yeah. Well, he, he he packaged it in a way that we had just never seen before, and it really resonated. So yeah, he was yeah. able to slip, slip something in that was totally out out of left field. And thank God, Alan Ladd Jr. was was the head of uh, 20th Century Fox at the time, or we would never have had it. And right. Then it's like wow, how many how many possible creations were we denied because some yeah left brain right. bean <laughs> counter was in charge. Well, think <laughs> about Caesar. This is you know anybody who's an artist um knows that the the best way to get the most out of artists that are maybe working for you uh, is to let them is to stay out of the way as much as possible if you trust them find the artists that you trust and you let them do their job like Guillermo's like this you know Guillermo del Toro he will as much as you know like any director he's going to want things to look a certain way because he's got the, uh, he's his responsibilities to make sure the overall vision is working together but he yeah. will um allow people freedom to uh he'll step back if something's not if something's not broken he won't fix it that's the way my experience with him has been anyway is uh and I, and I may be biased because of the Chamberlain I got to do where he didn't, you know, say anything about it. But even with, he let me design that totally on my own. And he That's saw it and he cool. liked it and he said, okay, he didn't make any changes. Same with the Hellboy's Right Hand of Doom. I sculpted that and he really didn't give a lot of input other than like trying to stay true to Mignola's um, vision of like the symbols and his original, the, the source material. But he yeah. was like, you know, if he liked something, he just would, he, you know, he'd, he'd be like, you know, let the artist do their thing. If it was work, if it was working, having that eye on the whole project, if it was fitting in his vision. And I think that's the smartest way. If you're, if you have artists working for you and you're in, in a, a head of a team is to, to get the best people that you trust and believe in and let them do their job. And, yeah. and and it will take your project to a higher level. I mean, think about Rick. You know, Rick Baker did this at the shop. You know, he would let people, he, I, you know, he, he, I can't tell you how much time we spent on Haunted Mansion just playing with concepts and, you know, because he trusted all the artists that were working for him. And he just let us sculpt, you know, and there was, there was time in the beginning. So he like let us sculpt all these different maquettes and and just come up with ideas and and that's what smart it's uh, so smart people do you're right and and it's it's so unusual and it's it's too bad um when you and i worked on uh, at the mountains of madness it didn't happen because oh, i would God, have, i know i would have liked to have um formed some kind of working relationship with guillermo yeah but we re it really didn't happen so but what as far as rick um yeah, he he gave us so much. He trusted us, yeah. and, and what a beautiful thing! And and it was and the best it, shot. It, it made the yeah. best work. Yeah, and it's because he did that. I think he got the best people, and he let them do their jobs without like micromanaging, which you see so many people do who run shops. They micromanage or pr production or studio heads, whatever. Uh, micromanage a project just, and you know it when it happens to you that they're making a suggestion just because they can, just because they want to say yes. they had, so it's an ego thing. And you can tell people like Guillermo who are like, you know, if you want your project to be the most amazing thing, then you know, when you know, when you should step back and accept something extra that you weren't expecting. And, and it's, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like uh, mm -hmm. if someone gives a suggestion and it's like, Oh, that's better than what I was thinking. You have to have your ego in check enough. If you're, if you, if you love the art and if you're serious about making the the art, if you're honoring the art God to the fullest, you have to step back and accept the gifts when they come to you. And, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the worst thing you could do as an artist is to inject your own ego into the process to the, where you're like, Oh, I didn't come up with that. So 
So mm -hmm. it's not, it's not good. It has to come from me. And, and it's like, when you create a great piece of artwork, that's what you're doing. That's why art is kind of like the spiritual practice because in order to have, in order to make a great art piece, you have to admit it's not all you. And, and sometimes you get gifts that just come out of nowhere and you have to go like, you know what, that's better than what I was thinking. And I'm going to go with that and I'm going to accept that. And my ego will allow me to, to, you know, or my, I've got my ego in check, or you have to have your ego in check enough to admit that the idea that came from the art God is better than what you had. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'll, I'll start on, on something and then I'll just something randomly, I'll have a happy accident. And it's like, if I was like, so st stuck in my own ego, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to change it because I, I, I wanted the credit. Yeah. I want to take all the credit for it. Like, uh, you know, it happens when you, when you, when you're doing something and something just comes up. If you're not an artist, it might be hard to understand, but when you're creating artwork and something is just kind of like a happy accident, something just comes out of nowhere, you have to, you have to be able to allow that in, I think. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I think you said that very well. Uh, that's tricky though, because, um, uh, it's, it's tricky because Friedkin on the exorcist he was totally just trusting his own instincts right. even to the point where he was rejecting Blatty, who was the conceiver of the whole concept. Right. And, and right. yet, yet he was, he was in some kind of zone where he intuitively. Yeah. It, it, it the, that he was, hmm, the art God was, was, was reassuring him. Yeah. It was keep, handing him things in Iraq. Yeah. It was showing him that underground bazaar and he, uh -huh he knew that that was like a gift, you know, or with all the, the different, the way that things with the actors worked out. Every time he said in that documentary, it was the art God. Those were moments when, you know, he was, he had to, he, he, you know, it's like, it's okay. Okay. I'm getting confused, but listen, listen, <laughs> this is what I'm trying to say. You have to, it's like, it's in the, in a way, in the way that like in spirituality and religion, you have to kind of humble yourself to God, right? You have to go like, you're greater than me. I am lowly. You are the great thing. Um, I honor you and worship you. That's how you treat the art. That's like the, the, the spirituality of, or the religion almost of art is that you have to honor the art piece and put it above you. And like, you are the important thing, not me. I'm my importance is in how well I can represent you on a canvas or on a movie or whatever. It's like, this is my way of honoring you is with this piece of art. And it's not about me. It's about you. And that's like how you're supposed to approach religion. And, and, the, and I think the reason that is, is because it is a way of, um, it functions well, uh, you know, for, for society, in the sense that it it uh, it uh, forces you to not think you're the shit. You know, yeah. it's like you're you, it, it it humbles you. Yeah. You know, which is kind of like we all know that humans have this tendency to get out of control and their egos to take oh, over. <clears throat> so I could see how that would function, especially when religion was. All the in, in ancient religions were invented. You could imagine the kind of mentalities that people had, and you had this this thing that was like, okay, this is going to keep people from, you know, it's going to help them to grow spiritual, keep them yeah. spiritually, and help them from becoming terrible assholes. So I, so I see that like, and it's like the easel, and even further, the easel to me is like this altar. And you put the painting up on it and the lights on it. It's all about the painting. It's not about the guy painting it. You know, it's like, you're lucky to be able to worship this thing. And you're given this, it's a privilege to be able to, to be given this responsibility for bringing this into existence. And you have to honor that and not be like, yeah, I'm great. Look at what I can do. It's like the painting is the thing. <laughs> You know yeah. what I mean? I don't know if that, I didn't totally. say it well, but no, you, you did. Know what and I'm I, totally, 
I totally agree. And I think what happens, it must be a subtle thing. And it's like a trap that all artists, once they've had a collaboration with the art gods, they just assume it's just going to keep happening. And they, they, they think every instinct they have is perfect. Right. And, right. and it's, it's like, there's a, there's a slight shift where the ego takes over and you don't, you probably don't even recognize it at first. It's when you get successful. Successful. Because you start thinking like, yes. oh, it's me. I'm the shit. And it's I, like, instead of being like, there you, go. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you said, you nailed it. It's, it's, it's when you get successful that that starts to blur. And, and then, and then the tether to the art god starts to strain. Right. And, uh, and you, you can see it. And even, even Friedkin in his book, he has a whole chapter <laughs> after talking about the exorcist and it's called hubris. Oh, wow. And and he and he goes on to explain how he just thought he was the shit and and he wasn't listening to people and he just went to this this uh this valley of 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 nader of unsuccessful uh movies. The I mean, Guardian. I remember he, he, put a, he made a movie called The Guardian. The Guardian, yeah, yeah. I just said it's the first thing that comes to mind. From the maker of the exorcist. And I was so excited and it was horrible and he was in a different frame of mind. Yeah. And he wasn't in the frame of mind he was when he was in the exorcist. And there's, it's not, it's not an attack on him. The, 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 the vehicle, the human, the, the expression, he, uh, William Friedkin was on his own little journey. He was in a different point on the path than he was when he was right. earlier. And, but, but he got humbled and thank God, because then he made like, I think he made the guardian after to live and die in LA. Yeah. He maybe got cocky. He made to bug live after LA. that. Bug's pretty cool. And Bug's good. So he he went through, he goes through peaks and then valleys. And that, I think, is the, if you were to look on a graph, that's a healthy graph right. for an artist. Success, down, deep, yeah, peaks, yeah, valleys. Yeah. You, you can't be successful all the time. So you're going to have these moments where your ego gets gets pretty big. I know I've had it. And, yeah. and I think that's just probably it's human nature. Help, human nature. And it's just all part of the journey. Mm -hmm. But But really quick. I love to live and die in LA. And yeah. that was like, that was like him. He had already been through some peaks and valleys and, and it was like another gift. And he said, it just flew. It went by really quick, easily. And it was, and then it was an incredible success. And it is to it. It is artist stylistically. If you haven't seen that in a while, it's amazing. I've he got, does stuff. I've got it up on my, in my browser because you can't rent it. You can't, the only way you can see it, is, I don't even think you can buy, or you can buy the, you can buy the DVD, DVD, but there is uh it's not streaming anywhere. And there is a, oh, uh, no. there's a link to, uh, I found it by searching where can I stream to live and die in LA. And there's a, a Reddit thread that has a link to internet archive.org and it's up there. So you oh. can watch it for free. So I'm going to watch it probably today. Oh, when was the last I time you've seen it? Uh, I watched, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so relatively recent. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great. He he had, when he, in that documentary, Leap of Faith, he mentions Grace Notes. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? And I love it because yeah. I think, I think when he started describing Grace Notes, he put, he put a, he put a name to what I think I love most about art and especially film and uh, it's little moments that don't make any sense, but they're beautiful, and they right. come out of nowhere. And they're and it's like, where the hell did that come from? The art god and and the art god or, <laughs> and and to live and die in L.A. has one of my favorite grace notes of all cinema. I don't. I, I don't know if you want me to, I don't know. I don't know I, I, no spoilers, because I'm about to watch it. Okay, I won't say anything, <laughs> and I'll see if you see it. But yeah, it's okay yeah. if you don't. Okay, because it's it's subjective. It's personal. You know, so, one th one of the reasons why I, I like that, why I watched it recently, like five or six years ago, is because a lot of it takes place in San Pedro, where I grew up. Yes, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I think about you when I see it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a little connection there. Oh, yeah, it's it's fantastic. But uh, so, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I agree with everything you said. Ego, I, I must say. I get a sense of relief in my fifties because my ego isn't this big. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, thank goodness. Yeah. It's like a, it's like this, this, this burden's been lifted. Right. And, and I, I'm not so preoccupied with my own success. Yeah, or, or yeah. 
And so it, it's a really good feeling. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm going <laughs> to, I might be poor and, 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 you know, <laughs> who knows where that's going to lead, yeah. you know, not having an ego as much. I still have one. Of course. But it's just you have not so, it's just not at the forefront anymore. And yeah. It's such a weird yeah, that comes with age. There's a lot of good things that come with age, really. You know, there's a there's a lot of good things about. It's like is it's as good as it is bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a, for all the bad stuff you get, like getting fat and getting old and getting gray and all the stuff that happens and getting being in pain all the time. It's like you yeah. get all these like uh, inner things. You know, you get more wisdom. You get a better vantage point to see things. You know, you have yeah. more experience. Um, uh, but, uh, but I want to bring it back to, uh, the exorcist again, okay. get, get back to the exorcist. Cause it kind of went off on a good tangent, but I mean, that's what I, I, I thought, I think that's great. Those, those are excellent tangents. Um, uh, one thing that, uh, I thought was really amazing about the movie, even when I was a kid seeing it was the, the sound, the sound mm. effects. And you, you know what I love is, um, and they rarely do this in films. It's like when, when, when you had all the demonic voices or you had the sound in the attic, which is totally the creepiest sound, those sounds in the attic, the, the it was so weird. It just was yeah. like, just perfect. But, um, you know what I noticed is like, whenever they put weird demonic voices in movies, there's always like effects on it, like delay or echoes. And they don't sound like they're in the room and, mm. and and they always do that or they put like weird mystical music whenever something's happening and it's like the exorcist didn't have like all this instant like i love when frank freaking said he didn't like music to tell you how to feel in the movie i, and I thought that was so yeah. brilliant and it's like that's one of the things i love about the movie it's got so much it's very quiet doesn't have uh extra music where it's where it's not needed but the but i love the way that the the voices are just like they sound like they're in the room with them they don't sound like they're recorded separately they don't like have an echo on it or they don't have a weird that's you know, a good point trying to make yeah. i mean i i've got an audio background so i'm super aware of stuff like that and i see it in movies and i'm like like whenever like uh last temptation of christ did this like when when i don't know if when he was hearing voices or God was talking to him or I don't remember now specifically, but it's just sounds like a, a voice, like a regular person standing there with not, you know, I hate when they have like uh, in a dream world or when a voice, when someone hears a voice, it's all kind of echoey. It's like, I yeah. like, you know, cause, cause the st stuff I've had personal experience with, like I've heard voices before when I'm falling asleep and uh, you know, something says something to me, I've had that happen. And it's like, it's never like, you know, weird. It's like, it sounds like someone's talking to you in your ear in this really direct way. You know, it sounds just like a voice and it's freaky. And, uh, and I think he just nailed it. Like all those, you know, the, the, the demonic voices are just with uh Mercedes Bacambridge are just like unbelievable. Amazing. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I that's you're right. You're right. Um and I that's a that's, big part of what I mean, th there was a lot of great everything worked. There was a lot of great elements to it. It was like everything was perfect in that film and, and the and the sound was one of them. Like I when when the priests first are, are going to uh, perform the ex exorcism and they walk in the house and there's that like i don't know if you remember but there's like this i don't know if it called one of their names maybe but it was like it's, yeah it was, yeah yeah <laughs> that sounded so to me that it, sounds so scary you know it sounds so yeah. something about it's just like <laughs> oh my god that's so creepy <laughs> it's so realistic so really so well done no i'm glad you mentioned that um it's worth watching just to listen to it because i think it, it yeah. also got like an academy award for sound editing oh good i think it, so it deserved it yeah yeah and it, it yeah and you know and, and the music uh yeah it, just how he was able to find tubular bells yeah yeah um, that's amazing and and you know again freaking wow i think he was one of the first to discover like tangerine dream 
Yeah. Because he used Tangerine Dream and Sorcerer. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm a huge Tangerine Dream fan. And and, and it's like, he just He's had got some good aesthetic taste. instincts. He's that got good almost, taste in art yeah. and music. It's like, Very that's, good taste. That's, a, that's also a big part of what I think what it takes to be a good artist is having good taste and knowing mm -hmm. what's good. You he know? does. Uh, he's talking about all those art, art, all these paintings and painters. Yeah, he the great painting and yeah, I mean that it was just really impressive. Yeah, he's just that. Yeah, super um, impressive. I'm going. To, I'm going to uh, criticize one thing. There's only one thing that I'm critical of in the movie. Okay. There's only one, and it's like, oh, I kind of wish they didn't do that. And it it does get into a little bit of the music, but when the movie's over. Because the movie ends with uh, Father Dyer just kind of, it, he looks at the the steps and they looks off and then it just kind of quietly just like, ends. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have this dar, 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 right, dar, right. a lot of music and it's like, it was a little, maybe he wanted to jar you, but it would have been so beautiful to have that ease into tubular bells. Yeah, it, I know, and, and right? It's, like, oh, it's almost like you want, to, you want to do an edit of that movie and then Yeah, just put, put that, that in. little chunk of loudness and just let it, <laughs> But that's it. That's, that would have been perfect. That's, that would have been perfect. That's nitpicky, and but it's like that's the only thing where I wish you would have. Made it's kind of like the the audio equivalent equivalent of a jump scare. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. Is... Yeah. It, it, it's like okay, yeah, I don't think you need to jar the audience anymore. I yeah. think they're <laughs> adequately traumatized. <laughs> and so. Yeah, but the tubular bells is it's just a it's just such a moody, fantastic. Yeah, piece. and it's it's funny because it's barely in the movie too, mm -hmm. and it's and it's so associated with that film, and it's and I remember like every when I was a kid hearing that, it was just you associate yeah. it with the film and it just creeps you out, it and it's almost like it's if I were to hear that without n connecting it with The Exorcist, I don't know that it would have been so such a scary sounding song. No, and. And you're right. I think he only used it. Um, he yeah. used it very sparingly. I think the one she, the beautiful Grace Mills that he talks about, where yeah. she was walking home from the set and she sees the nuns. Yeah, and the house and, and the trick or treaters, yeah. and they, they Friedkin used it there, and it was beautiful. Yeah, Perfect. yeah, and that was it. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so so well used. Yeah, yeah. Man, there was there was something I wanted to bring up that was such a good point. I know if we keep talking, maybe I'll just think of it, but. Um, well, I've I've got I've got a list of things that I wanted to see. Let me go through them and just see if there's anything that you wanted to talk about, like uh, 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 the music we talked about, uh, Linda Blair, Ellen oh, Burstyn, yeah. the actors, um, yeah, uh, the makeup effects. See. Come on, oh, we gotta okay, talk about the makeup yeah. too. We'll talk about that, <laughs> but that's not that's not the thing I was gonna. Oh, oh, I know what I want to say. Before I forget it, let me bring this up. You, you know what's interesting, and I only noticed it on this last viewing, is that. The, there is no divine. There's no divine intervention. It's like God, as a spiritual force, is not represented supernaturally in any way. It's like the devil is through the possession and all the weird shit that happens. But all of the 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 exorcism is is from those two guys. It's from the the two the two priests. Yeah. So it's almost yeah. like God is not in the movie in a sense like not as a spiritual force but through those two human characters which i thought was interesting it's like there's not like a like if you saw it, th there's some it's like the movie to me feels doesn't feel religious i don't know why it seems like it would feel like very religious film to me but it feels like almost like a secular movie in a way that's talking more about i don't know i just it's never struck me as particularly as religious as it should have for the subject matter. And I, and I think that maybe that's because the, um, because there's, there's no, like, uh, like even at the end of the stand, remember the hand of God comes down. It's, yeah. it's it was like super, oh super, super, super dumb, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, there was no like divine intervention. It was like just these two human people and you never have any, there's no sign of like, a spiritual god anywhere in the movie that i could see isn't that interesting well it, it depends on you know definition of god if it's if god is love it's totally represented sure in sure it. sure but as but, a, I, but I as know, a spiritual force in the way that the devil's represented the devil's represented as a supernatural force there was no like supernatural force of good that is, is portrayed in it 
I hadn't thought of that. And I, I think you're right. Um, it's interesting. that is interesting. Yeah. I'm, um, as much, yeah, if God was represented, it, it was, uh, it was through love, some more subtle and sublime. Right. And, uh, yeah, it was nothing overt. Which is what Um, makes, I think what makes it great. You know, I think anything like if it would have, if there would have been something, you know, I don't know, Jesus showing Oh, up it or would something, have been, it would have been so bad. oh yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Although, you know, <laughs> at the time, okay, when I watched The Exorcist, I have to disagree with you just a little bit. Okay. For that two hours, I feel like a Christian. Be I'm, I'm Catholic for two hours because I buy, I buy, I buy the whole threat, Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, because I, I, I don't I, believe the doctors. I'm going, yeah, they're running right. what they're talking about. And so he freaking expertly brings you into that, that world to, Yeah, to where he's like, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a, that's true because you you buy you definitely buy into the mythology presented in the film. You believe it while you're watching the film. It just doesn't feel. I don't know. I guess it doesn't feel. Uh, It doesn't feel dogmatic. not preachy It's not preachy. it's not preachy at It all doesn't, it yeah just doesn't feel like it's, it, to me, it doesn't, it, it doesn't feel like it's trying to tell you that Christianity, it's not, that's not the, you can tell that's not the goal of the film is that Christian, because it's not about Christianity. It's about good and evil. yes because Karis the whole point of Yeah. what makes Right. his character so beautiful is this crisis of faith like Right. we all worry and 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 just question Doubt. Mm -hmm. doubt and uh worry about our loved ones and and so yeah Karis was such a great conduit or that's relatable to everyone and so yeah it, i think that was the key it was the key Yeah, that's just it's uh interesting that that you know, you know normally a movie like, like that would get pegged as like a a uh, it doesn't come across as a prop Christian propaganda. It doesn't come across No. as a Christian propaganda, and a film like that could easily come across as that. Although I think it had, it was so powerful. Uh, I'm going to relate to another friend of mine. My parents, uh, when they saw it, uh, <laughs> they saw it with another couple that was like my parents. They weren't religious. And uh, that couple that my parents went to see The Exorcist with, shortly thereafter converted to Mormonism. <laughs> so I don't know, was it, was it the exorcist was the catalyst? I don't know, Oh, but that's that's funny. interesting timing. But I think it's so powerful though, <laughs> that I could see why, what, you know, that people could, you yeah, know, yeah. and, and the, the, the priests in the movie were so um, compassionate and warm. And Yeah, so, there wasn't yeah, any asshole religious people in it. That's another no, thing. There wasn't no. like the fundamentalist assholes. It was like they, they seemed to, Yeah. the priests all seemed really human and, and, Very human, very relatable. yeah, yeah. And they were a reassuring presence presence Right, in the right, movie. right. So yeah. So how you're, we're about the same age. You're a little younger than me, maybe. I I'm fifty-three. Okay. I'm 55. Okay, so just we're basically the same age. yeah, Just we're grew up just the same old. stuff. We're just old. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you remember when it came out? Do you, how, No. what, what's your first memory of, of the exorcist? Cause I got a pretty good one. Ooh. Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I think I remember seeing a commercial of Ellen Burstyn's reaction in the bedroom. I Oh think yeah. when at, at night and I didn't know what it was. I think maybe I was watching sneak previews or something, but I was, I was only um, three at the time or four. So I really don't have, memories of the exorcist but i have such vivid memories of jaws which was only 75 Right. so it's amazing that that uh how much more clear and responsive i was to jaws as opposed to the exorcist but then again jaws was was marketed to everyone and Right. exorcist kind of like this this scary thing that it was you know that people whispered about but no what was your You memory were born in like 69 or 70? 70 1970 Okay, okay. So, yeah. And it came out in 73. So you were three years old.
Yeah, 73 or 74. I can't remember. I, I think maybe 74. And okay. I don't know. But okay. yeah, point is, you were five. I remember writing 74 on my paper <laughs> in school. Oh, okay. So so I was probably in the first grade or something. But anyway, I remember, I remember hearing the stories because I was six years old maybe when it when it came out um so i remember hearing the stories from my brother and sister my older brother and sister hearing the stories about people were passing out throwing up mm -hmm. in the theaters because people were like fainting and it, if you look at it um and real and look at the other films leading up from around that time it was shocking it was totally shocking. There was it was the most shocking movie ever made, I think, really up to that point. And it's like everything after that built upon that. So it's like our tolerance for what shocks us is has lowered because it's become repetition and we're kind of used to it. But yeah. um but I remember at the time, I think that I think really the only movie like that I don't know, maybe Psycho, but Psycho's so tame compared to that compared to the exorcist but night of the living dead had a real similar documentary yeah. feeling um and they had people eating guts and stuff so that was kind of shocking at the time too but um anyway my experience was i remember hearing about it and so just like when you hear about something i remember hearing about taxi driver and having this oh. creepy feeling about you know seeing commercials and hearing these stories and like I remember hearing about Texas Chainsaw Massacre and like my imagination was so much creepier than the movie was, even though it was a great movie. Like, you know, people tell you things and they get passed on from kid to kid. And yeah. it's like, I remember just <clears throat> imagining, <laughs> I don't even want to get into it. I imagining all these things that weren't in the movie that, that I, my imagination was like way creepier than, than what was in the movie. But anyway, I remember hearing all the stories and just being terrified of it. And what uh, did you, so wait a minute. So your brothers, did your brother, sister, did they, did they see it? And then kind I don't of talk know, about it, it, was, it? It was, it was all in the news. It was like mm. a big explosion in the news. So it was like newscasters were talking about it. It was like the thing that people are talking about at school and stuff. It yeah. was huge. It was like a big, bombshell went off and so, i just missed it yeah, yeah you yeah. caught it you barely caught it. I, I just, just it. caught it <laughs> and um and i remember when it first came out maybe it was 74 now because i i remember famous monsters did a, a an article on it when it first came out and they wouldn't allow any stills from the movie Ooh. and so it was all artists rendering like they had an artist go in they said they had an artist see it and then draw representations, but they probably gave them stills to copy is my guess, because they were just like, they're like really nice renderings of the stills you see in the movie of like Reagan and stuff. And I remember seeing those, I think it was on the cover. It was like a painting of Reagan was on the cover of famous monsters and reading it and just being so scared from those pictures their pencil drawings inside that i couldn't sleep at night like oh, wow. i remember just laying in bed being like oh i can't like having that scared feeling <laughs> where it's yeah. like you feel all hot well. you feel all hot <laughs> and just you like... don't dare move yeah you're immobile in your bed and you're sweating and, hot. Yeah. and i don't remember seeing it for the first time i think it was you know probably uh when i don't know when video recorders came around and you went to rent a video re recorder and then movies were like, you had to rent movies. And if there were $90 for a cassette, if you bought it, oh, you, could, yeah. you could never buy it, you had to rent it. But that, so that was probably not, not until I was like 14 or 15, but it was really scary when I did finally see it. And I thought it was, uh, it lived up to my expectations for sure. But, but I remember, do you remember beyond the door? Oh, from beyond the door or be, no, 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 that's, beyond the that's door. It was like on shutter. I think I need to see that. No, I it's like a that, really, really bad exorcist rip Italian exorcist ripoff. And apparently the, I don't think I've seen the whole movie, but the whole movie is so bad. 
But all you have to watch is the trailer because they show all the scary parts in the trailer where, of course, you know, um, the nanny from Nanny and the Professor, I forget her name. She she was like the Linda Blair character. Remember that show, Nanny and the Professor? No, but I've seen pictures of the character in Beyond the Door. Okay. But she, so I know what you're talking about. It's really freaky. Yeah, she flips her head around and it's really scary. It's it's scare. I think it's scarier than the Exorcist head spinning, to be honest with you. Oh. And you could if just search the trailer on YouTube and you'll yeah. see it. It's I'll like it. there's something yeah. about the expression on her face and the way her head turns around is so creepy. But I remember um, just seeing the commercials for Beyond the Door, scaring me, like to where I couldn't sleep as well. Um, but that's that's that was my experience was just seeing seeing those drawings and and it was like the the drawings were even so scary that it scared me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I remember seeing that famous black and white photograph of, of Reagan. That's that where they kind of, sli it's, it's kind of um, iconic, but it, they were, there's a slight overlay of Captain Howdy on top yeah. of Dick's makeup. Yeah. And I just remember that's the freakiest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> it was so scary, but let me ask you, what was, what, what scene in the movie scared you the most or is the most unsettling uh you know i and i thought this this time i still think the freakiest the creepiest there's a lot of creepy it's hard to choose there's so many mm -hmm. good you're scary, right it's creepy, kind of an unfair question but the one that stuck out to me is that there's that one quick shot where she's going blah, 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 darting her tongue in and out and her tongue is really long that to me for some reason is so creepy Chat, that's what I was going to say. That's my scene too, because I think it was building up to a point where it was like we've reached maximum uh, capacity, and then it's like that tongue scene was just like over the. It's like, oh no, it's going too far now. And it's also and it's, it's quick. Dread. It's quick, oh. and the way it's shot, I think it's kind of over one of the priest's shoulders. It's not too yeah. long, and it's like in the midst of all this stuff. It's so disturbing. So it's, disturbing. Yeah. That's amazing you said that because that's the same scene. You just like your your dread is almost it's almost you're faded with dread, and then that happens. You're like, oh gosh, that's when the the psyche gets scarred. Yeah, and that's that's me. That's me in prophecy. <laughs> but yeah, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. But one of my favorite scenes, and it's not necessarily the scariest, is the dream sequence. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. With that's that's yeah. I thought that that was one of the best dream sequences ever, ever made because there's no yeah. audio it's so much like a dream it's like the way they shoot it is like you can tell it's like extreme telephoto lens like mm -hmm. zoomed in so everything's kind of like flattened you can tell you can oh. tell when when something shot from really far away and it's zoomed in oh and yeah it's, and it's got right. that look to it and where she cut where the she comes up out of the subway and it's like so in, again, it just inspired. It's perfect. Yeah, perfect. I, just, I think it's one of the best dream sequences ever made. I do, I do too. It oh. so rings true to what you know that feeling of a dream. You know? Yeah, and he, he's calling to his mom, and she can't hear him, and he can't, they can't make connection. And it, oh, and, and then she just descends her. down. Oh, it's I so creepy. Oh. <laughs> Oh, good. It's so subtle, too. It's not like, you know, it's a bunch of demons grab her. It's like she just kind of goes down into the subway. Goes, it's just, yeah. Oh, my hell. It's so much It's so much better than if they would have overstated it and did mm -hmm. something outrageous, like have her pulled into hell or something. You know, going... Perhaps some subliminal position. Right, right. Overlaid like they did on the special edition. <laughs> okay, but, let's, uh... let's, get, let's talk about the so-called subliminal flashes that were in the original which i think are really amazing i think they're yeah. super super great and, and and i love how he said it's not subliminal if you can see it it wasn't subliminal it was just a flash of that yeah. the, the captain howdy face and, and it's and it was you know it was like a uh just like an accent or something and and yeah. and I think yeah. it was super effective. People talk about it to this day, and I and I think that makeup, I think that makeup super creepy. That simple makeup is like so. It's it's just so weird that uh, I don't know. Dick Smith had a knack for for making great 
creature. Basic makeup. Mo- yeah, ba- yeah, basic. Just a highlight and shadow. Paint and it's makeup. and it's and with the teeth, there's something about it that just is really creepy. And they have, mm-hmm. I don't know. There's something. Uh, uh, maybe it was the structure of the actress's face because it was I think the stunt double that was in that makeup. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we should talk about the 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 effects stuff too because the the makeup effects were uh, so great. Um, and that's, that was like another groundbreaking aspect of that film was the, the effects work, like the, the throat bulge. Yeah. I think was the first time bladders were used in a movie. Yeah. I think, I I think it was before Joe Blasco did it for, uh, uh, shivers. Shiver. Yes. I think so. It had to be before. uh, I had to be 73. Yeah. Um, Dick Smith is just amazing. Yeah. Um, I, but, you know, he it wasn't easy for him. He had to earn. It, he had to go through a very rigorous labored process, you know. So he was a, a he was in the trenches there with freaking and it couldn't have been easy. You know, oh, Even yeah. in Rick, Rick's book, they were saying how, you know, freaking would reject, you know, makeups that they thought they had settled on. And and uh, but well, if you look at some of those early some of the early makeups some of them look really cool and some of them look terrible did you see there's yeah. some that are just like they wouldn't have worked they're like funky weird hair it just looked so weird on some of the very early ones so it was a process apparently yeah he had to get those out of the system to get yeah yeah work. right Finally, and that's arrived. that's part of the artistic process you know it is yeah it's time yeah, again we're talking you have to time. have time you had to have time to if get you didn't to have time if you would have made that movie nowadays, you'd be stuck with one of those early ones, and it just wouldn't have been the same because you yes. didn't have the time to process it. And, and, and it wasn't there, and it wouldn't have been as effective, and and it wouldn't be what it is. That's today. what drives me nuts about these the 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 this kind of corporate studio system. Now it's like, don't you want a movie that's going to make money for forty years instead of a bunch of money right now? You know, because that's what they're going for. That's why they won't give you, they won't give people the time, is they want the quick money. It's more like this more, more now, and who cares about the future? You know what I mean? But, but think about all yeah. the money that the Exorcist has made for that studio over the years. But you know what's sad about what you just said is that's the prevailing men- mentality of humanity right now. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so uh, I, I think, yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. It's gradual. It's tragic. Yeah, it is. Um, I, of course, you know, it doesn't make sense to us. But, um, yeah, it, it couldn't be made today. And you know what's amazing about The Exorcist is, okay, I could watch Psycho and I could watch Night of the Living Dead. And I can I love them. But it doesn't it doesn't have the visceral impact. Whereas I watch the Exorcist, I'm like, wow, they couldn't get away with that today. Yeah, right. And, and it's like that's amazing. I mean, uh, the masturbation scene. It's yeah. like how ballsy that was. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And they did it, and they knew they had to do it because they she had something so horrible had to happen that the mom resorted to going to the right, priest. Right, right. And so right. It, it it was shocking, and it had to be so. Yeah, and, and that's like, it wasn't well, cheap. It wasn't like no. a cheap shot. It was like, it felt like, okay, this movie is. They're really. He was really going for extreme horror and terror, and it felt like integral. It felt appropriate. It felt appropriate. Mm-hmm. As horrible as it was, it felt like it made sense with. You know, if you had to go that far, it's like it had to be there. You have to go all the way with it. And, and yeah, imagine that. Imagine yeah. being him in 1972 and 73 when they were shooting. Yeah, I, I remember him saying they shot it in 72 and 73. Imagine that being in 72, 73 and, and being like shooting that scene and being like this mo- this scene has to be in my movie. Talk about, you know. Yeah, you have it. <laughs> it's, it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. But you know what? There was a there was a certain respect for the audience. He, they were treating us like adults. Right. That, yeah. Okay, we're going to give you material that that okay, it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit rough, but you can handle it. Right. And and, and so that's invigorating. It's kind of like the movie Seven. 
which I was, um, mm -hmm. if seven didn't compromise in it, and and I think, you know, it, that ending was pretty incredible. Yeah, it was yeah. bleakness and disturbing. Yeah, and yet it 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 was true to the story. It 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 felt right. Right, and I right. think people inherently respect when they they're being treated they're given respect right and so if you placate or pander or 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 coddle uh, and uh, the audience it's not going to work well and, what's and the exorcist did not do that it said we're you're gonna you're, you're gonna have to handle this and we know you can yeah yeah you know? i mean and it's part Come of on. the the uh artistic integrity of it it's well i think what's the quote from i think it's picasso or i i may be wrong but some famous artist said the bad taste is the enemy of art or something like or good good taste is the enemy of art or something like that it's something like you know if you're worried about uh you know if you're worried about offending people mm -hmm. you it has to serve the art it has to serve the piece of art and, and all other concerns you can't they have to be out of the picture it's like so so if that serves the, the 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 piece of art something distasteful like that and kind of horrible then you have to go with it you have to do it if you're going to maintain the integrity of the piece and and freaking and blatty were or you know let's not forget how they were incredibly intelligent mm -hmm. so they, they were able to think their way through these things as well i mean uh blatty knew that that scene had to happen freaking knew that that had to happen they didn't let any morality or or anything get in the way of it and they were and yeah yeah i i i agree yeah yeah it's like if i i think if i was making that movie would i have the courage to put that in i don't know that i would have i would have been able to do it well it's you would have definitely had a lot of pressure on you not to. so it's like it kind of took a crazy nut like friedkin who was kind of you know known as being kind of crazy on set and demanding and, and he t tells that story about um the ending with i forget the the father's name when he's going to give his friend his last rites how he couldn't cry when he's giving Karis his he couldn't cry and he's like takes he's like i can't do it and he's like freaking do you trust me or do you love me yes do you trust me yes and he just punched him in the jaw and pushed him in front of the camera and he got the, yeah and the guy thanked him after yeah you know, which is kind of amazing if it's true you never know uh uh <laughs> so well, he did shoot guns he shot guns and i yeah, yeah right shot they guns. both they both acknowledge that that happened and and it takes a certain kind of um yeah a, a individual a certain kind of uh, audacity right and, and and a sense of purpose to do that and freaking had it and yeah. he was almost like yeah he was the perfect person to do it maybe the only person that could do it yeah, yeah. and and i mean kubrick uh turned it down and, uh, they said mike nichols and uh i think kubrick would have made it too sty stylized or something you know it's like it's, Look at the shining is very stylish. It was never meant to be. Kubrick was never meant yeah, to do it. I just so can't, it, it had to have that documentary feel. Yep. I I think in order for it to have maximum impact. Freakin was the vehicle and Blatty knew it and the art gods knew it and everybody knew it and he knew it. Yep. And, uh, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's it's extraordinary. Extraordinary. And uh I outside of David Lynch, I don't know of a lot of directors nowadays that go to great lengths to follow the subconscious and right. and especially doc, doc directors that are given a budget there's one exception recently though and that is um have you seen um Bo is afraid no but someone told me to see it. it it's kind of incredible it's 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 i he had a budget ari aster the director writer had a budget and he took advantage of it i have no idea total... i don't know anything about it so I, i'm i'm planning on I'm watching not gonna it say going anything in other cold. than yeah i'm not gonna I think say someone anything told other me than it, it's going cold. okay okay yeah. yeah someone told me i i think it was that film don't don't look it up just watch the movies cold not knowing anything it, it it's a rare experience watching <laughs> it, so. okay uh but um makeup effects 
Let's okay. let's get a little bit of the makeup effects. So, I thought that <clears throat> you know one of the most underrated aspects of Reagan's makeup. We're gonna get nerdy here, people. So we're we're effects nerds. That's who we are. So deal with it. Um, <laughs> I thought that her having no eyebrows was a huge part of what made her creepy. And it's like back in the early seventies, no one shaved their eyebrows. It wasn't like a thing that you ever saw. You know, she had they had eyebrow coverings on for her for the most part, and like brow like brow appliances. And it's like between the contacts and the and her having no eyebrows, I think, is what one of the creepiest parts of that makeup. Mm. I, I really, yeah. if you look at look at it and think about eyebrows, having no eyebrows, it's like Marilyn Manson and all. It's like normal to try and look creepy nowadays by shaving your eyebrows. But if you shave your eyebrows, it's a totally weird look. It's a creepy, creepy. It's an easy way to make yourself look creepy. Shave your eyebrows. Oh, yeah. Had had. <laughs> Had there been anything like that? Not that I'm aware of. I, I I don't I can't think of anything. I mean, I'm sure they they. I'm sure it has been. I mean, I know that Richard Corson stage makeup book has. I don't know if you remember. That's one of the first books I learned yeah, makeup. I they have uh, sections on how to get rid of eyebrows for like yeah. you know Victorian or a queen. Queen Victoria makeup or something back yeah, then, maybe yeah. when maybe they I remember that. But anyway, uh, so, uh, another thing I thought was super cool was, and it never occurred to me until this time watching it this time. I never uh, and hearing uh, Freakin's commentary, they they kind of did the makeup, all the most of the makeup effects except for the like the turning, the head spinning, were things that she could have done to herself. Like all the, all, like the, the wounds could have been her cutting herself and yeah. they help me even, you know, it's like, that. that's like, uh, uh, it could have been scratched, you know, like that's something that in, in some famous poltergeist cases that were proven to be, uh, faked. People would scratch themselves or scratch words in and it would kind of like form. Well, and oh, and yeah. so and so it's, you know, so, you know, I know that Blatty was against the head spinning because he wanted to make you be like, OK, was was this stuff she was all doing to herself, like scratching? They weren't, you know, I always thought when I was a kid, they were just creepy wounds. I never thought about that. She was mutilating herself. But that but. <laughs> That brings up the point. Do you think maybe the head spinning was too much? I don't think so. I think it was amazing because okay. he, Blatty was like, what did he say? He said, I just read this yesterday. He said, uh, oh, I forget what the quote was, but it was something like, uh, he didn't, he thought it was too far. He thought everything should have been like, he, he like it was too unrealistic he thought the head spinning was too unrealistic he said he, he said I like can... you can't do that you can't a head couldn't spin around yeah but even the projectile vomiting that's possible that could have been yeah. projectile vomiting uh but i thought it was you know that's one of the one of the classic things is the head spinning it's iconic it is. And and to me it's it was I bought it I bought into it as uh as as life is crazy. <laughs> you know, it's like it's it's as as implausible as someone being possessed by a demon. There you go. You know what I mean? I I, I do because um I I I agree, but at the same time I kind of agree with Blatty that it, it, it was maybe, it, you know, it, it, it was maybe a little bit um, incongruous and in that everything was kind of adhering to reality. But, and that, but, 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 but then he, it's, again, it's so powerful an image that it's right. It, 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 it sears into your mind. It's and he, and he, and he said, uh, I think the quote is once again, I was proven wrong by free kid because it's Ooh. such an icon. Like he kind of admitted, Oh, he was wrong about that that it was it it worked that's the thing 
it did work it worked and that's what matters it's like if you're yeah. so stuck to okay it has to be 100 percent realistic that's intellectual that's uh -huh. not intuitive you yes, know you're right so it's like even though this is doesn't fit within the realism thing it's it's, it's right right and it yes. and, and as a movie you know we you, both of us could uh see that now that clearly it was the right thing to do yes you're right chet you're right i i was i was going into more yeah intellectualizing conscious <laughs> and i know you're right freaking was in the right he was in the zone and he knew when to adhere to yeah the instinct and intellect and so he he both he he straddled both yeah you're right and it is it's powerful and also it, it well it did take it's it's so well done yeah <laughs> i mean dick smith is so good it had to be believable and in, in yeah yeah and yeah. that made that makeup was so um it's so streamlined i mean there really aren't very many appliances on it other than just the scars and the brow right this is a maybe and the contact maybe something on the lips yeah and, then yeah. The, contact. and the teeth if I were to, teeth are yeah, all dirty if I were to be really critical i'd almost say the contacts were too much but i'm i'm gonna go back to what you just said is it felt right so right yeah, yeah. i i was i was thinking that watching you know not fully consciously but um now that you mentioned that i i realized how like extreme the contacts were which i never thought of before but again that's iconic now and that's in mm -hmm. that's when you have someone possessed by a demon you put you put weird contacts in that's yeah. like the standard and let's not it forget worked. let's not forget the uh scleral lenses how creepy that was the white mm -hmm. that was super super creepy and that and and I, but again that's like that could have been just her rolling her eyes up in her head you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that kind of like stays within the the reality thing other than although but she was levitating yeah that's true yeah she was <laughs> levitating come on but that was such a beautiful shot i know so, she's, she's levitating and so well framed and lit it was, it was just extraordinary it yeah at that point in the movie it's like you're 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 committed and he's taking you yeah he's taking you where he's going to take you and you're along for the ride and no committed. music just them saying the power of christ compels you it's and just the look in her face and the oh it's just it was like uh it was kind of spiritual in a weird way you know what i mean it felt like i don't know there's something about it that was just like beautiful i guess yeah in a weird yeah. disturbing way well, it, it is beautifully filmed. It's the sounds beautiful. The music, I mean, it's, it's such a, okay, I'm going to, I almost forgot this. Um, uh, you know how, uh, I'm, I'm going to say that people need to rethink this, the exorcist curse thing. Oh yes. The exorcist. Curse. I don't, I don't think it was cursed. It was blessed. Okay. It was blessed. It was blessed. Right. by the art god it was blessed with freak and it was blessed with finding linda blair it was that's blessed true. it was blessed on own so many ways it had way it more blessed. more blessings than the curse than things curses. that they they, yeah. they say that when i think of that movie and why i get exhilarated because it to me it's it's evidence of something mystical yeah it's proof of some of the mystical ingredient to the creative process it's like it's it's not stuck in this conscious uh, you know, uh, uh, materialistic world. It 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 really does have something uh, transcendent, mystical about yeah. it. And, and it's so it to me, it's the Exorcist blessing. And to me, the Exorcist cursed is this special edition ring. You know, the director's <laughs> cut. That's a here curse. we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, so, for people who don't know the ex. I'm sure everybody listening knows, but the the uh, the Exorcist curse is. A crew member got his toe cut off. Someone got their finger cut. A crew member got their finger cut off. People, a kid, someone's kid died. Someone died. Uh, one of the actors died. Max von Sydow's uh, uh, brother died. Right. Um, Jack McG McGowan, who played the director in the movie, he died. Right. Um, but um, let's see what else happened. The set burned down. Set burned down. That's that. Okay, that's pretty weird. The set burned weird. down, except for Reagan's room. 
That's what I read. I don't know if that's true. Oh, okay. I don't know if that's true, but but uh, that's interesting. Yeah, you could say that. You could say that's a curse, or you could say it's a blessing too. Yeah, that... <laughs> well, but is but isn't this movie about? The, yeah, the, right. The the good and the evil, the, the yin and the yang, and and going at it. So, but but, this... but okay, what what if you know, what if the curse? If okay, let's just let's just go with the curse theory for a second, even though we don't think it was cursed. Okay. What if the curse or what if these bad things that happened were the result of the energy of the film they were making mm. manifesting from people's minds in a way? Yeah. You know, like the, the idea that Grant Morrison and his, uh, uh, the Invisibles comic book was, he said it was a hyper sigil. He started putting himself uh, in the comic and these things started happening to, happening to him in reality. Like he put mm. this character that looked like him and that acted like him and it got really sick. And then he got really sick and he put like a, him meeting some girl that looked a certain way in the comic. And then he met this girl. It's like all these, he started realizing that this thing he was putting his <clears throat> artistic creative energy into was beginning to manifest like as if you were just d doing a magic sigil is manifesting in reality. What if the, the, the fear of the people making the film, like crew members and stuff like the, the fearful, you know, what if it was like their fear that was manifesting in that way? Physically? That's a really good that's a really good point, and I, I'm I'm with you on that. That's totally plausible. You know, because what you focus on manifests physically. I, I really do believe that. And I, um, I, I think that's very interesting. I think you're yeah, that that could very well be. Um, but and so it could have been like um yeah, it could be the their forces were at odds on that movie. Yeah. You know, and so it's like um the crew that's what the, the movie public. was about forces at odds yeah yeah you know? so it, it's just consistent with everything you know that okay there was an exorcist curse but there was also an exorcist blessing and the blessing outweighed the curse because and yeah and in the movie the bless the the, bless, the, the good thing. one you know so it's yeah. like it kind of was maybe consistent you know consistent with that uh, although the the they say one of the things they say anti curse is that that was more of a hi hype driven by the studio, you know, which kind of yeah. makes sense too. But and also, some uh, Blatty was saying he didn't believe it was cursed. He was saying the movie filmed for a long time, and when you're doing something for a long time with a bunch of people, people die, people get sick, people get injured. It's like yeah, you know. But, See, but that's why I never I never put much uh, um, credence to the the curse thing because I I tend to agree with that. But at the same time, what you just said is consistent with what I think is possible. Yeah, you know. So I but but I do think there's something extraordinary about what that movie represents. What Freakin was able to pull off, mm -hmm. you know, really do. I I mean, if people don't know. Just the fact that uh, he was able to get Jason Miller is is one for the books. Oh yeah, to already have a movie cast or an actor cast for a movie, and and then to just off of a, an instinct say we're not going to go with him. We're going to go with some unknown that I just happened to serendipitously meet when I was watching his play, and then yeah. the studio has to go along with it. I mean that is amazing. Yeah. And then not only that, but to have it work. Yeah. And have, and Jason Miller and Ellen Burstyn too. Yeah. They both said, "I am this character," and and by their force of will, they made it happen. Also. Yeah. And then and then Linda Blair. Oh my goodness, she was just like one of the last people yeah. that you saw. They were worried about whether they're even going to cast the movie, and she comes in and she's perfect. Yeah. Right. So, blessings <laughs> yeah 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 this it, is amazing it, yeah yeah it was kind of, it was it seemed like it was blessed in the way that like you're saying the art gods it was blessed mm -hmm. in, a, in a in the in a way that the um that a great art piece is blessed um 
when things are right and things line up, they happen in a way that's, you know, set, you call it ser serendipity serendipity or synchronicity or whatever but it's like things all click and unlikely things happen to serve this amazing thing yeah you know it'd be yeah. one thing if all those things lined up and then the movie was bad but all those things lined up and the movie was one of the greatest movies ever made yes. you know so it's like yeah. kind of the proof the proof is in the pudding or the proof, proof the pudding's in the eating um yeah yeah uh uh, uh, uh so I want to cover all the effects stuff. I, I will it just quickly um, before we wrap things up because I know I'm, I'm keeping you a while here. But um, oh, don't worry about that. The 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 the, uh, the help me on the stomach is one of the the classics. I think also uh, the the amazing technique of using one 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 that you know what one 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 is nobody else knows what one one was it one is unless you're in makeup effects trichloro trifluoroethane i think it's called so yeah <laughs> toxic ass thinner that we used to use to thin uh um clean brushes and to thin 355 I think it's it may even be uh outlawed now yeah, i think I, it is I yeah i think it is <laughs> but he painted that it, it it swells foam latex and he painted that on this foam latex uh prosthetic on her stomach and then they filmed it in reverse and as it evaporated it 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 went uh are they it as it evaporated it flattened and went away the swelling that said help me and then they mm -hmm. reversed it so it looked like it was appearing which is uh you know pretty brilliant it is simple how did dick smith come up with that yeah 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 it's uh you know and, and he he did Didn't that. he say that he threw some uh, some old foam appliances or something in a container that had that chemical, and it just kind of exploded? And I thought, ah, oh, and he kept it, and then realized he tried it on The Exorcist and it worked. Oh, I don't know. That could, that yeah. could be. Yeah, yeah. But it, but again, it's like what a what a wonderful solution to that problem. Yeah, it's yeah. just incredible. Yeah, yeah. He was he was, and then yeah, that's the other you know another amazing thing is that Dick Smith was the effects guy on that because there really was nobody like dick smith at that time in in effects he was he was the guy like that that you know father Marin makeup again that the max von Cito old age makeup is one of the classic old age makeups i remember not knowing he wasn't an old man i thought he was an old man the actor was an old man when i saw the movie i didn't realize he had like this kind of subtle prosthetic makeup on his face and you know that so if i were to be ultra critical i could look at that makeup and go oh i can see where the appliance ends and the stipple starts or <laughs> there's can, a couple I spots can, where you could see a little bit of yeah. edge, edge lifting but, but come on but <laughs> then he did something in the, the 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 cheek sculpture that was absolutely beautiful he emphasized the one thing that needed to be emphasized on on uh max von Sydow's bone structure and and it is something that you see in people that it that it's 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 just that crease that nasal labial fold or whatever that comes down, and that was the exact thing that needed to be emphasized subtly. And and I think I remember seeing the appliances somewhere. I can't remember oh, where really? it went. And you know the the Mitch Devane technique of texture hadn't really been um, uh, created yet, and so those appliances were very minimally really? textured. And I think maybe that's why I look at it and say, oh, it didn't quite match the stipple. Right. And 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 stipple doesn't really represent how next age, but it doesn't matter because when you in totality yeah. take in that makeup, it's a, it works. Yeah. It works totally convincing. Because it it wasn't just the prosthetics too. I was thinking about this. It was the way he, he grayed the hair and the yes. eyebrows. It was like expertly done. Because you've seen this done in movies to where they age someone mm. and then the hair looks like shit it doesn't, it doesn't look real work. yeah you know yeah. dick would do things like on the the sunshine boys where he would go into i think it was walter Matthau where he thinned yeah. his hair out by cutting little pieces of hair out every so often it's like he he was just uh just a uh a, a mat he was a master you know he a was master he he, he, he was like he 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 was someone he was like kazu reminds me a lot of dick in the way that um kazu even kind of looks like dick in a way i, I see a resemblance which is so yeah. fucking weird but yeah. um but kazu's 
you know, I, I get there's a few Matt Rose is, is kind of this way too, but Kazu more uh, focused on makeup in the way that Dick was. Uh, always trying to figure out the best way of doing something, you know, yes. the very best way. Like even again, we're getting nerdy here, but even like Dick using his soup spoon to 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 put the uh the he had this like it was like a ladle or a soup spoon to put the puke on her and there's scenes of him you could see like of him taking the the puke and putting it on her and it's like this soup spoon he used is like it's the perfect thing you would use to put that like i would take a cup and it would be all messy and i would pour it on her and it would be like and i'd throw the cup in the bucket that's how i would do it because i'm not that focused on doing it the best way possible he found the perfect soup spoon that is like it, you, when you see him using look it up after because there's okay. a video of him and it's like yeah that's the perfect thing you would do to lay even for something simple like <laughs> how to lay the puke on it's like he was just like that you know everything he was just so into it you know he was just so into it, what he was doing and that's and it always drives me crazy when i see blood on someone's an actor shirt or something where you can tell it's just been brushed on yeah, yeah, you know yeah. and and so <laughs> i never thought of that but yeah everything he seems to do he seemed to just have the right instinct even the, the blood spurting were of uh during the 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 uh -huh. night, that was so authentic and realistic yeah. looking you know yeah. it's like how often do you see even nowadays blood that's too transparent do you ever mm -hmm. notice this in horror movies to where it's suit too see-through it's it's like it looks like they tinted they put the food color in but they didn't put the flour or the peanut butter in to opaque it up oh. it. and it's like i see this all the time in movies and i'm like or when it beads up it'll beat yes. up on a blade and it's like it looks fake and then dick was the one who figured uh -huh. out putting that photo flow stuff in there yeah to to to, to make it so it didn't doesn't beat up it's like that's you know and some some silicone especially if you put the blood on it it'll beat up on silicone right. and and that always it always stands out right but, right yeah, yeah uh, hmm. and it it's aged so well that reagan makeup there's yep. it's perfect yeah i it's so well done the color choices uh the the bruising yeah mm -hmm. it's so so good yeah yeah, amazing. What an amazing person and artist he was. <laughs> yeah, Just yeah. Amazing. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Dick you know, back the man. back real quick though. You you mentioned how uh, that Captain Howdy uh, makeup was so well done, but you know what? It kind of reminds me of hmm. that wonderful shot in American World from London that Rick did on David Naughton. Oh it's yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was just kind of the same: the contact lenses, paint, makeup, and. Teeth. I wonder. I wonder if that was inspired by The Exorcist, because Rick worked uh -huh. on The Exorcist. Yeah, yeah, and I love that makeup on David Naughton yeah, yeah. so much. It's so powerful, yeah. and it's like a flash. Yeah. Just like the um, Captain yeah. Howdy. Mm -hmm. I and bet you it was so, inspired by that. <laughs> but but Rick and Rick is like Dick. He's does he no one can do like those highlights and shadows with paint makeups. Oh yeah. Better than those yeah, two. Yeah. I definitely he, he, I want to get Rick on the show just because it's like all he does now is just have fun. <laughs> and he posts it on Instagram. It's no, like, you, don't, you don't want to interrupt that. <laughs> <laughs> I I want him to talk about it. I want to hear what it's like to be able to just do whatever you want. And have fun because clearly rick is just doing whatever he wants he's got no financial considerations he's just making cool makeups masks and stuff it's so cool to watch it's like watching a kid just play you know and i and i i need it right now i need to see that what because I, I not to get into it too much but i i just don't have much inspiration right now um, and so i still value rick yeah you know creations and well, and uh check out I, his I, instagram because he's got oh i do i'm on yeah. it <laughs> yeah believe me i love it um but uh what was i gonna say oh i lost my train of thought that's okay you're having trouble with uh inspiration lately yeah it gets back to the ai it really does oh, yeah that and, really uh, threw you for a loop and i'm it did and i'm not gonna totally blame ai because i could kind of i kind of had some uh 
uh, foreshadowers of it. And you remember that app that aged you on your phone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That disturbed me because it did it so well. Yeah. And that came out, and that I guess it was util utilizing some kind of AI. And I'm thinking, at first I'm going, ooh, I can use this if I were ever to sculpt an age makeup. And right. then, wait a minute. It's doing all the heavy lifting. It's finding the it's finding the right way to age someone and that should be the sculptor's job or the designer's job right and then and then even in zbrush there are certain ways to do things where uh, that's too easy i don't want to go there i don't want to go down that road i don't want to go down the road where there's a tool in zbrush that allows you to create um, cloth folds right and, um, because sculpting cloth folds and fabric is hard but when you do it when you're able to do it and it works finally after hours and hours, it's satisfying. Right. I don't want a cheat to do that for me. And so I guess it's not just AI, but technology in general. I I guess it, it depends on the individual as to self-regulate. And where do you want to go in? And what do you want to try? And what do you where do you want to pull back? And and uh with AI, I I I'm there's nothing I want to do with it. Even even um, music, you know, because I've been doing a little experimental short films. It's like I don't know how to play the piano or do anything like that, and and I do feel, ooh, but I could use AI and do something that could just do most of it for me, so I can see the allure right. and I can see the temptation of it because I, I, that's where I want to use it. But I'm I refuse on principle okay. to do anything. Okay, let me. I'll I'll push back a little bit, even though we said okay. we were going to talk about AI. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. It's an, I'm no, sorry. no, no. This is an organic you're conversation. Probably, you're probably so sick of this. No, 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 no. I'm just like, I, I, I immediately think of the, the uh, a reasonable uh, argument against what you're saying, or to some degree. Now, what okay. if? Okay, one thing is, where do you draw the line? Because, you know, I've painted pictures. You know, the 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 hardcore um, oil painters will use a model only and they will paint it from life. And that shows that you're like a complete badass. That when you can paint from life without photos, without tracing, whatever. And yeah. um I've done that before. I've painted I've painted from reference without tracing and it's really difficult. And yeah. if I want to get a likeness now because I've done it and I know I can do it and I don't have the time, I'll tra I'll project it and trace. Mm. Uh, I'll do that with paintings. I, um, I, I'll do a Photoshop painting and I, and it's like, I've captured something in Photoshop. I'll project it so that I get the same thing when I paint it and then use my Photoshop painting as reference. And these are all like tech technological shortcuts. And it's not because I don't want to do it. And even if it was because I don't want to do it, that's fine because I know I can do it and I've mm. done it. And so yeah. once to me, it's like once you know, once you've proven to yourself as an artist that you've done it, you can you can cheat because when it's especially when it's like for me, I've got to make, you know, uh, every moment count. I've got to I have to do things in a timely manner if I'm going to survive. So I'll yeah. project things um, if I need to. And so that is, you know, that's yeah. even what uh, um, the guys that use the camera obscura that was a cheat back in the day um so you know you're kind of saying ai is 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 too too much of a cheat which i you know is reasonable but my other my other point i'm gonna barrage you with points and then i'll be done oh, do. Please do. <laughs> no the, the other point is like okay if you're a an artist and because of ai at, if you use AI as a tool, you'll be able to create work greater than you would have without it as a tool. In the same way that you can, if you know how to use Photoshop, it helps you, like Photoshop is a, is a really helpful tool. ZBrush is a really, these are all like helpful tools to help you realize your vision. And if it allows you to make a better, it's like, that's the thing keep the art as the focus and if there's a tool that's going to make the art better then you have to get over it because the art is demanding it the art's like i don't care if you like ai or not 
your job is to make me as great as I can be. And if that takes AI assistance, then get over it. Mm -hmm. And it demands that of you. It's like, if you're the artist, you have to go like whatever you want, whatever's best for you. But I'm not saying that that's necessarily true because that really is different from artist to artist. What the yeah. art God is saying to them. Maybe the art God is saying to you, I don't want you to ever use AI in anything you do. But I'm just saying from that alternative perspective, I can see, I can see that as like, cause I, cause I, cause, okay. For example, I edit the, uh, I can make clips editing this podcast. I can make like one minute clips or 30 second clips for promoting the podcast using a program <clears throat> called Descript that transcribes all the audio and you can edit the video by by finding the sentence, if you go through a two hour podcast, listening to it, it's a pain in the ass to try and find out spots to cut out. Oh, like that. But if you yeah. can read the transcript, you can see it in a second. And then this program, you just highlight it and delete it. And it makes the cut in the video, which is like, for someone like me, who's totally pressed for time, it's huge. It's a huge, and, and I could also like cut out a paragraph that I want to make a short of for, uh, TikTok or Instagram reels to promote it. And it will just, it'll transcribe, it puts the text on, it will like put captions on in different fonts and stuff just from, from hearing it, you know, from you. And it's like, to me, that's like, it's a non, it's not creative. It's, it's allowing me to do more with my creative yeah. project, you know? So it's like, yeah. It definitely has a place, I think, in that way. But, you know, I'm not into it doing all the creative work for you. But if it can give you ideas, I, I have no problem with, like, generating basic ideas maybe from it and then using that, like, hmm, that could be a cool painting or... That, I, I uh, it's, it's, it's a good point, Chad. I can't argue against it. Um, I think it really does boil down to the individual yeah and they have to determine where that line is for sure and and where they feel like if i cross that line or go down this road i'm going my my skills uh will dull or mm. soften and it's like wh wherever that you just have to determine you have to self-regulate to be able to determine how you can be the best creator you can be right. and everybody's different everybody's circumstance is different so i i i i i'll concede that there are people whose circumstances are totally different than mine and might be to perfectly primed to do something extraordinary with ai um and 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 the end and i'll and I, i'll have to accept it when i see it uh and i have to accept that possibility but intuitively when I, it gutted me and, and I haven't recovered and I, I don't, I don't feel the magic anymore. Hmm. But this, this is just me. I, I know, but, I know someone else that, that f feels exactly the same way. It's like, they were really into digital painting and 3d digital art. Uh -huh. And once AI came around, they were just like, there's no it, point it, anymore. It went too far. It went too far for me. And uh, I I think what it is, is I, I get inspiration from other artists because they can, they, can, they can document or provide me a way to measure human capability. So when growing up, when I was so, Rick Baker was my role model because he showed me what was possible in sculpture and, 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 and it, it invigorated me and I wanted to emulate that. Rick was a way for humanity for us to celebrate the accomplishments of humanity. And so it was a gauge. And then Dick Smith was a gauge. I can measure what's possible with humanity by watching, by seeing what these people accomplish. accomplish. I don't trust now what people are accomplishing because it's, I, I, it feels like it's the whole thing's been contaminated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't, I, I see, if I see it, something that's interesting me, an, an artist, I go, 
or an image, I say, well, I don't trust it because right. I, don't, I don't, I can't measure. There's no way for me to measure the human capability behind this. And so it's just like, uh, it's like, it, it's like losing your religion. It's just like, yeah. uh, it, it, I, so I don't know. I'm in a little nader, but, but I can, I can survive this, but I can, because I, I have things I want to create. So I, I know, so that's okay. But I, I will say I'm not excited about creature design anymore. Yeah. Nothing excites me about creature design. There is not a new way to create a, 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 a cheekbone or some things that's going to surprise or excite me. Right. <laughs> but the way it's presented can excite me. The way it's lit, the way it's suggested, it's almost we're, we're reverting back to when when uh, Les was born. And whereas, you know, in the 70s, you couldn't show much because they didn't have the the, the ability to create something worth lighting properly. Mm -hmm. So they had to cheat it. Now, I, I, I I'm visually sated, overloaded. And so it's like, I don't want to see anything. I right. want things to be suggested again, because seeing everything, seeing a, uh, everything fully lit and, and all the resolution doesn't do it for me anymore. Yeah. And and so I, the, what, but what, what killed me with AI is, is abstraction. It, it, I felt like I had something to offer makeup effects because i loved abstraction and so i felt like oh this is maybe my little niche and uh then when i started seeing ai and seeing oh it, it, things started to get very abstract and surreal then it's like i thought shit i'm i'm done <laughs> i don't my niche has just been filled well, well and, i mean are you even were you even doing effects work much anymore? It seemed like you're kind of onto something else, like doing, what are you doing? I mean, how are you making a living? Uh, collectibles. Oh, okay. I'm, so I'm just still doing stuff for Sideshow, but I'm still a fan of uh, movies. And yeah. I'm still a, mon a monster kid, but not so much anymore. Because hmm. I, I, I feel like all of the monsters have been, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> but There's, i mean it, didn't you I'm feel overloaded yeah didn't you, you didn't you feel that before ai though yeah you know because it's like it's you know but i could always hold this little selfishly hold this little abstract process that i had formulated right. for myself and then ai i don't know i i feel it. i feel like you visualizing your own works is still completely valid and uh a place where you could work for creating work for just like, I mean, I'm still doing monsters, you know, I'm, and it's like my own vocabulary and, you know, maybe someone could duplicate it. I've, I have seen a module based on my artwork that oh. you could, people could, that someone's selling like an asshole and, but it yeah. sucked. Oh. It sucked. The samples, they ha didn't look anything like my work. I thought I was like, but that's just a matter of time. I'm sure someone will make one, but it doesn't, I mean, my, when it comes to my market, the people who are fans of mine and who are supporting me financially, they want original artwork. They don't yeah. want a digital image of something that, a, that an AI did that looks like my artwork. They're just, they, yeah. they wouldn't be, I mean, they might be interested in looking at it, but I don't think they'd like want to buy it or buy a print of it. Yeah. Because when you get into physical art pieces, it's about hand touched physical pieces that the artist made by hand that you get to own or you get a print of that it's signed by the artist and it's all about the relationship between the collector and the artist and yeah. that's all that matters to me you know because they're the ones supporting me i i worry about young kids growing up now it's like it's like would you even want would you even want to go to art school because what are the boundaries now it's everything, everything's cloudy. Everything's um, unsure. Everything's been done. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, how, how, you know, it's like uh, AI can exhaust any possible concept instant, you know, within seconds. Right. So it's like these concepts are being uh, chewed out and uh, chewed and spit out so fast that 
and this this is getting into the, the reservoir of possibilities is getting filled quicker than it should. And um, I, I I totally I love what you're doing, especially I love those small paintings, Chet. You know what they <laughs> remind me of? They remind me of like uh, baseball cards that are yeah. so fun to hold. <laughs> I just love them. It's like you could keep them in your pocket. <laughs> yeah, they are so wonderful. Of, no, you. what you're doing, you need to keep doing. I just love it. Oh, thanks. So, but it, but as far as um, I just think some the paradigm has shifted and not in a good way. And for me, this is again, this is just me. Yeah. It's my life. I'm bringing my life experience to it. And it's just an opinion. And, and, and who knows? I mean, yeah, who knows? But it, but I, I, mean, I now only do things for me and I'm getting back. And that's actually the healthiest way. It's like what you're saying, just do art that you want to see. Yeah. And someone will connect with yeah them. for sure so. for sure yeah 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 that's the main thing as long as it you know you can i i just don't i would not want to see you so bummed out that you stopped creating your own work that you think is cool no I, i'm i'm gonna create stuff definitely yeah. but i don't i don't the little monster kid that was ryan is is no longer in existence so yeah. much He's, there's a there's a flicker of, of flame left but it's not like it was and yeah. and, it, and i and i feel i i i'm saddened by that yeah and uh, i don't yeah i i just i i don't care about monsters on in movies anymore but i am excited about the guys like ari aster or uh or um Panos cosmatos who are presenting these things differently and creatively mm -hmm. So that's exciting. So that's what's keeping that little flame lit. So like when I watched um, Mandy, mm -hmm. uh, have you, Pan Panos, Cosmatos is Mandy. He was presenting these bad guys in a way that was exhilarating to me because yeah. it was like backlit, heavy shadow. You didn't know what you're looking at. Yeah. And it yeah, was, was so great. refreshing. Yeah. And so I I get excited about that. It's like it, I, I, I'm going to be excited about presentation. And, you know, getting back to Rob Bottin, uh, you know, we talked about him a lot in the last ones. I love how he presents things. Yeah. And and the way the thing was presented with all the shadows and stuff, I just love. Yeah. But but then when he when when his even his process was was contaminated a little bit, when you see Deep Rising, he he lost the reins or lost control or whatever. But the CG was overlit. And and the creature didn't have the dramatic impact. Yeah. And it was like, I know this is a Rob Bottin movie, but I'm not feeling it. And it's like, what's so what was lost? And and it's it is and we're just seeing too much. Digital has has just uh overload overloaded our senses. Yeah. May or overloaded my senses. So I'm I'm just becoming more of a minimalist and, and purist. And so I'm I'm heading in that direction. But um, yeah, so I, I'll be fine. I'll be fine, and it's I don't a, mean to exaggerate that gutting. But I, but I, it's part. But something it's, has shifted. Yeah, but I mean, that's part of your journey as an artist. You know, it is. it's like, yeah, you know, if you have this kind of mystical perspective about life, which I know that you do, you know, these it's happening to you for a reason. You know, I don't think it's, 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 you know, it's like painful things happen for a reason. It's like there in you hindsight, go. you can see all these terrible things that people did to you. And in hindsight, you're like, oh, I'm glad I went through that because I got this out of it. And it helped me to be the person I be, that I'm now. And I'm happy where I'm at now. And you're just like in the middle of that painful period, <laughs> which is not fun, but it's like when you get past it, if you work pat through it and get past it it probably because you're um such a great artist i think that once you get out of it you will become you will end up being a greater artist than you were before that happened and I, although it doesn't feel that way now because you're going you're going through it at the moment i i you're absolutely right chad i totally agree and 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 um yeah I, I, you're, you're totally right. And you know, you, you have a lot of stuff going on in your life too, with your, you know, your parents are getting older. There's other, th other factors that are probably adding to this, this. Yeah. This is my moment in time. It's all of ours. Right. 
And, and so I, 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 yeah, you're right. I can't. So I, I know you're taking care of I them, agree. and they're getting. I went I through that. I've taken care of my parents when they're older. My, it's like it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to do. It's like it's a stage you go through in life. Yeah. You know where your parents get to at that point where they need to be taken care of, and it's just it's like a stage, and it's like you know you've got multiple things hitting you, so you just have to keep going, and and you'll come out of it, and you'll be you'll be happy. That's my prediction. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. You're so right. <laughs> I agree with you, Chet. I agree with you. Yeah. It's just hard to see it when you're in the middle of it, you know. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. But um, yeah. I, I... <laughs> Real quick. <laughs> what 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 made you decide to do small paintings? Um, I was like you know what? It was, uh, I, I was like, okay, I got to make some money because I got to pay this bill <laughs> at the end of the month. And I'm looking, and whenever that happens, which happens pretty much every month, because I'm not financially set in a way I would like to be. And I'm looking around and I saw these panels that I had bought a long time ago, just as a uh -huh. whim. And I was like, oh, these are two by three panels. These are pretty cool. What if I did little paintings? And then I was like, okay, maybe if I could find a frame on Amazon, then I, then I could, you know, that would be cool. It's like, I could make some money. I needed to pay the bills. That would be fun. Cause it's like, it's always gotta be that. Yeah. It's gotta be, that's the game I'm playing. It's gotta, it's gotta make money. Unfortunately, I wish it didn't, but it's like, it has to make money and it has to satisfy me creatively and be something I think is cool. And that hit that was ticking all the boxes and i found this frame and i was like oh man this is cool and then and it's like my daughter-in-law is like you know who's not totally into monsters and stuff she just loves them she thinks they're so cute <laughs> it's like everybody loves them because they're cute <laughs> i i love them i i think they're so much fun but also you know when i go in my studio i've got these big paintings and they become a burden Look and so i don't even want to work big I yeah work yeah small. yeah let me show that again Oh, I just love them. They're so oh, fantastic. I can't, I can't get the. Oh, they're fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, and then you, uh, you uh, doctored the frame a little bit to to kind of give it your signature. Yeah, I sculpted. It. I found I, I found the frame, sculpted over it, and I'm casting these ones in glow in the dark. So I love glow in the dark. That takes me back to my childhood. I used to love glow in the dark stuff when I was a kid. So. Oh. Yeah. Well, they're, they're just fan. I love them. Oh, I thanks. love them. So. Yeah. And it's. Yeah. Well, necess what is it? Necessity is the mother in of invention. Yeah. And, and you're, you, yeah, that's how this happened. So. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to take, you know, uh, yeah, I'm trying to enjoy it. I'm trying. I, I am. I, they're fun. They're fun. It's like the only thing that isn't fun is the time crunch. I got to get them done by a certain time so I could sell them at a certain time. So that I could pay my bills off. I got to do my, my tax extension runs out next month and that's going to be brutal. So it's like, I got to make a bunch of money. So, so yeah. Uh, it's, How long does it take you to do one of those? Um, I was, I'm averaging, I mean, I did, uh, you know, five or six a day, but they, they really, they, yeah, they require like a little, Oh my goodness. M another pass maybe. So, wow. But yeah, they, I, I can, you know, if I have the idea of what to paint, I can bust them out quickly because they're so small. Yeah. <laughs> and the, tr and, oh. the and the challenge is trying to make them all different and unique, you know, because it's like when I've got, I'm trying to do 44 because I have 44 panels, you know, and I'm like, okay, I gotta, I'm trying to make each one its own unique character. And that, so that's like a kind of a fun challenge in a way. Well, it's it's uh, you're rising to it because I'm I'm amazed that you're able to to figure out so many cool face designs. <laughs> I was like, wow, he just keeps he just keeps finding new ones. I mean, I'm, this is incredible. <laughs> I mean, I follow like a, a definitely there's definitely like a structure to these kinds of characters I paint. Like they don't have noses. There's certain things I always do, but I but if I can somehow, I, it's, each one has to meet this a criteria of like okay it's unique it's its own character and, yeah. and it's like i can't <laughs> it, once i once it hits it i know it and, I, and i'm and i can move on to the next one but <laughs> fantastic Thanks. yeah well, well i appreciate yeah. it we might have to do some trades <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some sculpture yeah <laughs> once i get my well and, and once i get my taxes because... done 
I will. Small things, small things are so um, uh, attractive to me now because they don't take up much space. And right. so when I saw them, I was like, oh, I wish I would have thought of that. I mean, I'd love to paint. I've got a big commission I got to do, like a 36 by 48 inch commission. It's going to be really oh. cool. I can't wait to do it. But, um, you know, to, to, to do that just to sell, you know, it's like who's you have to find one person that, that's going to pay money for this big ass painting that happens to like the big ass painting that's willing to spend like, you know, over 10 grand on a painting. And that's hard to find. But, you know, you can find someone that will spend four hundred dollars on a little framed, cool little yeah. painting that's original. It's you know, it's just a small version um so it's like you're doing a lot of little things to get the money you would get for a really big thing that's way harder to sell just out of curiosity is this large painting it, do you get to choose the subject matter it, uh, i i do, yeah i discussed it um it's actually uh from one it's from my one of chris velasco one of my big my biggest collector i think um, he's got mo the most pieces, I think. I think he beat Guillermo. I think he passed Guillermo up because Guillermo used to be like my biggest collector, but he stopped buying my stuff. Um, he told me he was he had to stop because he was a Chetaholic. <laughs> <laughs> he like told me, you know, like he let me know, which was kind of cool of him. Um, That's really cool. He's like, I can't, I can't keep doing it because he was buying everything for a while, and um, but. Uh, uh so yeah we discussed what the subject would be and the first one i just i couldn't get into it and then we picked a second one that he wanted and i couldn't get into that one either and he's such a great he's an artist he's he's a music musician for video games so he's an artist also so he gets it and uh, he wants the best piece possible and, and he knows <laughs> he knows that he knows you have to be into it yeah and it's like i tried both of the things i was really trying these ideas and they were cool ideas but i just couldn't i wasn't feeling them and then he um <clears throat> i don't know how we we came up on a third concept and it was like oh i really would love to paint that like that's it gave me that excited feeling and that's what you want when you're doing a commission for somebody that was it. Yeah. if i was hiring someone i would want them to be hey the real collectors that understand the art making process or that are artists themselves know that uh, you you want the person creating the painting to be excited about doing it, and it's like I'm yeah. I'm yeah. super excited about painting this painting. So, um, oh good, yeah. So it'll be a good one. It'll be a really cool one. Um, but anyway, okay, let's wrap things up. Do you what, do you have any uh, final thoughts or or things that we didn't get on your list about the Exorcist? Because again, um, again, I'm glad we went in all different directions because that's what this podcast yeah. is all about. And it's super interesting to me. Um, so so I'm not, <clears throat> this is like the exorcist AI conversation, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> creature designs. and I'm sorry for the AI stuff. No, no, no. But, but knew I, knew, I knew it was coming. <laughs> we, it's, it's, we've been needing to talk about this because we've been going through it in text for a while. So it's good to get it out there. But, I um, guess if, the one thing I want to leave is that let's let's start just promoting the Exorcist blessing, yeah, <laughs> instead of the Exorcist curse, because I, I I I think that's the way people need to start seeing this. Yeah, it's it, it was it was a blessed production, uh, an amazing production, and one of the most incredible uh, movies ever made, and probably uh, an end of an era. I don't know if ever. You're going to get the kind of star power, the kind of financial backing, the studio support. He had, he, uh, let's see, I think William Blatty had um, Final Cut, but he kind of relinquished that to Freakin. So oh, that's really? Incredible. Yeah. Hmm. So it's an amazing movie. And I, I think it was a blessing in many ways. And underneath the subtext of it all, and this is what I was reminded of in the book, it's, it, there's something beautifully human about it beautifully mm -hmm. compassionate it's about a crisis of faith it's about the basic questions that we all have why are we here how can we be a better person how can how can we cultivate compassion and it's all of that yeah so so yeah it's extraordinary one of my favorite films and one of my favorite books 
Yeah, I have to read the book because I've never read it, but um, <clears throat> I definitely want to now. I, 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 after hearing you talk about it, especially, but um, I'd like to say that uh, I think it's it's a it's a really spiritual movie. You know, it's def and 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 it was nice to hear Freakin talking about him using the word mystical because he he mentioned the word mystical at, at certain yeah. points, and it really has a mystical feeling about it in that weird, mysterious, what, you know, mysticism is, is like a mysterious power that we don't know really where it comes from or what it is. But, you know, if you've experienced it, you know, it's real and it's a thing and, it, and it's that art spirit. It's, it's like this whole other hidden dimension of, of reality. And, um, and, and, and the movie feels it's weird for a horror movie to be so spiritual and mystical and and some people maybe they need to just rethink their reaction to it because i think a lot of sometimes um you know the, the subtext can get lost in the um in the the visceral quality of something right. or and and i think you know people need to get past that uh, the the pea soup vomit or the masturbation scene and realize how incredible what the incredible subtext and motivations behind those those plot decisions was and uh i yeah totally i i totally i so agree with you the mystical part of it I th it's, I, it's yeah i'm sorry i yeah. think that i think that the the um the, the spirituality and mystical aspect of it is like it's as much a spiritual film as it is a horror film like mm -hmm. like how how intensely it is horrific it's it's in that intensely the intensely spiritual mm -hmm. you know so it's like you I, have to go that deep and ho horrific to get that like kind of that level of exaltation or or spirituality out of it you know what i mean absolutely and i would say even in the book it's even more spiritual than the movie hmm. Now, Friedkin's approach was was like you know we talked about this earlier was more direct more realistic and and uh, uh Blatty wanted to infuse it with more of the the spiritual symbolism right. and, which wasn't appropriate for the movie so much because the movie is what it is but the book all that stuff serves it so well and and yeah when I, I was in awe of the book when I finished it I went this is not what I was expecting wow yeah I can't and wait so yeah can't it's, wait to it's, read it and and tell we need to tell the the listeners that to check out that leap of faith documentary. Oh yeah, that's great. In honor of William Friedkin because he 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 what a character. What a, yeah. what an amazing I love man. Him. He seems yeah. so cool. I just like this guy's cool. Um well, even if even if he was complicated and not cool in other aspects. Yeah, you know, he, maybe he was hard on set. What when you watch that leap of faith, you just you can't ignore the the how extraordinary he is yeah. in the way he sees life so yeah okay I have, to, I have to say yeah leap of faith it's not there's a leap of faith movie with steve martin and that's not it because <laughs> i'm searching it it's like some wacky comedy no. comes up it's um, on shutter yeah the yeah. documentaries on shutter if they, people have it but yeah okay uh there was two more points i just thought of and i can only think of one okay, okay. I'll, the other one forget it but one last final thing you know what's interesting is that Friedkin is not a horror guy, and he made like arguably the greatest horror film ever made, or definitely one of the greatest horror films ever made. And the other cool thing is, it's one of the greatest movies ever made, and it's a horror mm -hmm. film, which mm -hmm. is really weird. You know the great. And you know they they don't celebrate that enough. They always say, "Oh, it's one of the greatest horror movies made," but. I challenge you, it's one of the greatest movies right. ever made. Definitely. And one of the most ex incredible productions right. that have yeah. ever occurred. It's, yeah, so it's like the epitome of the, what the of among the greatest movies of the 70s. And it just, ha so that's the way I see it. And it happens to be a horror movie. And it's like, you know, he's not like George Romero or one of these guys that's no. a horror guy. He's like a film guy, you know. Uh, in the same way Kubrick made, you know, did a, really scary movie with the shining you know it's yeah. like he's not a horror guy either so it just kind of goes to um what a the great artist, filmmaker he was yeah the artist is larger than the genre right and and, and so you it, you 
blessed are those artists that can 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 jump genres and still like Kubrick and provide something amazing and for he, us to all and enjoy. He was, and he was able to cha- as a as a true artist, which I think may, uh, shows that he's proves he's a true artist. He was able to channel that horror movie god or that horror movie yeah. spirit. Um, you know, as an artist, you're able to embody those spirits that we talked about earlier the different genres each genre has a spirit and he, he nailed it with he the did. horror the horror spirit oh, <laughs> the horror movie spirit so beautifully <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh that was great man let's 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 just say oh, good thank you. Say good, thank you for thanks for bringing up the idea um thanks for letting me talk about it what a treat yeah super thank fun you. i think we should do more more things like this um talking about films because that was kind of well, the ori- it's dark art it fits within the whole theme of this podcast i know if anything's dark art it's the exorcist yeah true <laughs> exactly it really is so uh just just uh don't hang up and then say goodbye so you have to say man i remember last time you have to say goodbye to the audience and however whatever way you like to say goodbye Goodbye. Uh, Thank you, William Friedkin. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye, audience. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for listening.